Book Three, Chapter One of A History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator Unknown. Book One, Chapter Three. Reflections upon the domestic discords of republics. A parallel between the discords of Rome and those of Florence. Enmities between the families of the Ricci and the Albizzi. Ugotioni de Ricci causes the laws against the Ghibellines to be renewed in order to injure the Albizzi. Piero degli Albizzi derives advantage from it. Origin of admonitions and the troubles which result from them. Ugucioni de Ricci moderates their injustice. Difficulties increase. A meeting of the citizens. They address the signory. The signory attempt to remedy the evils. Those serious, though natural, enmities which occur between the popular classes and the nobility, arising from the desire of the latter to command, and the disinclination of the former to obey, are the causes of most of the troubles which take place in cities, and from this diversity of purpose all the other evils which disturb republics derive their origin. This kept Rome disunited, and this, if it be allowed to compare small things with great, held Florence in disunion, although in each city it produced a different result, for animosities were only beginning with the people and the nobility of Rome contended while ours were brought to a conclusion by the contentions of our citizens. A new law settled the disputes of Rome, those of Florence were only terminated by the death and banishment of many of her best people. Those of Rome increased her military virtue, while that of Florence was quite extinguished by her divisions. The quarrels of Rome established different ranks of society, those of Florence abolished the distinctions which had previously existed. The diversity of effects must have been occasioned by the different purposes which the two people had in view. While the people of Rome endeavoured to associate with the nobility in the supreme honours, those of Florence strove to exclude the nobility from all participation in them. As the desire of the Roman people was more reasonable, no particular offence was given to the nobility. They therefore consented to it without having recourse to arms so that after some disputes concerning particular points, both parties agreed to the enactment of a law which, while it satisfied the people, preserved the nobility in the enjoyment of their dignity. On the other hand, the demands of the people of Florence, being insolent and unjust, the nobility became desperate, prepared for their defence with their utmost energy, and thus bloodshed and the exile of citizens followed. The laws which were afterward made did not provide for the common good, but were framed wholly in favour of the conquerors. This too must be observed, that from the acquisition of power made by the people of Rome, their minds were very much improved, for all the offices of state being attainable as well by the people as the nobility, the peculiar excellencies of the latter exercised a most beneficial influence upon the former, and as the city increased in virtue, she attained a more exalted greatness. But in Florence, the people being conquerors, the nobility were deprived of all participation in the government, and in order to regain a portion of it, it became necessary for them not only to seem like the people, but to be like them in behaviour, mind, and mode of living. Hence arose those changes in armorial bearings, and in the titles of families, which the nobility adopted, in order that they might seem to be of the people. Military virtue and generosity of feeling became extinguished in them. The people not possessing these qualities, they could not appreciate them, and Florence became by degrees more and more depressed and humiliated. The virtue of the Roman nobility degenerating into pride, the citizens soon found that the business of state could not be carried on without a prince. Florence had now come to such a point, that with a comprehensive mind at the head of affairs, she would easily have been made to take any form that he might have been disposed to give her, as may be partly observed by a perusal of the preceding book. Having given an account of the origin of Florence, the commencement of her liberty, with the causes of her divisions, and shown how the factions of the nobility and the people ceased with the tyranny of the Duke of Athens, and the ruin of the former, 
we have now to speak of the animosities between the citizens and the plebeians, and the various circumstances which they produced. The nobility being overcome, and the war with the Archbishop of Milan concluded, there did not appear any cause of dissension in Florence. But the evil fortune of the city, and the defective nature of her laws, gave rise to enmities between the family of the Albizzi and that of the Ricci, which divided her citizens as completely as those of the Buono del Monte and the Uberti, or the Donati and the, and the Cerchi had formerly done. The pontiffs, who at this time resided in France, and the emperors, who abode in Germany, in order to maintain their influence in Italy, sent among us multitudes of soldiers of many countries, as English, Dutch, and Bretons. As these, upon the conclusion of a war, were thrown out of pay, though still in the country, they, under the standard of some soldier of fortune, plundered such people as were least prepared to defend themselves. In the year 1353, one of these companies came into Tuscany under the command of Monsignor Rial of Provence, and his approach terrified all the cities of Italy. The Florentines not only provided themselves forces, but many citizens, among whom were the Albizzi and the Ricci, armed themselves in their own defence. These families were at the time full of hatred against each other, and each thought to obtain the sovereignty of the Republic by overcoming his enemy. They had not yet proceeded to open violence, but only contended in the magistracies and councils. The city being all in arms, a quarrel arose in the old market-place, and, as it frequently happens in similar cases, a great number of people were drawn together. The disturbance spreading, it was told that the Ricci and the Albizzi had assailed their partisans, and to the Albizzi that the Ricci were in quest of them. Upon this the whole city arose, and it was all the magistrates could do to restrain these families, and prevent the actual occurrence of a disaster which, without being the fault of either of them, had been willfully though falsely reported as having already taken place. This apparently trifling circumstance served to inflame the minds of the parties, and make each the more resolved to increase the number of their followers. And as the citizens, since the ruin of the nobility, were on such an equality that the magistrates were more respected now than they had previously been, they designed to proceed towards the suppression of this disorder with civil authority alone. We have before related that after the victory of Charles I, the government was formed of the Guelphic party and that it thus acquired great authority over the Ghibellines. But time, a variety of circumstances, and new divisions had so contributed to sink this party feeling into oblivion, that many of Ghibelline descent now filled the highest offices. Observing this, Uguccioni, the head of the family of the Ricci, contrived that the laws against the Ghibellines should be again brought into operation, many imagining the Albizzi to be of that faction they having arisen in Arezzo, and come long ago to Florence. Uguccioni by this means hoped to deprive the Albizzi of participation in the government, for all of Ghibelline blood who were found to hold offices would be condemned in the penalties which this law provided. The design of Uguccioni was discovered to Piero, son of Filippo degli Albizzi, and he resolved to favour it, for he saw that to oppose it would at once declare him a Ghibelline, and thus the law which was renewed by the ambition of the Ricci for his destruction, instead of robbing Piero degli Albizzi of his reputation, contributed to increase his influence, although it laid the foundation of many evils. Now it is possible for a republic to enact a law more pernicious than one relating to matters which have long transpired. Piero, having favoured this law, which had been contrived by his enemies for his stumbling block, it became the stepping stone to his greatness. For making himself the leader of this new order of things, his authority went on increasing, and he was in greater favour with the Guelphs than any other man. As there could not be found a magistrate willing to search out who were Ghibellines, and as this renewed enactment against them was therefore of small value, it was provided that authority should be given to the Capitani to find out who were of this faction, and having discovered, to signify and admonish them that they were not to take upon themselves any office of government, to which admonitions, if they were disobedient, they became condemned in the penalties. Hence all those who in Florence are deprived of the power to hold offices are called ammoniti, or admonished. The Capitani, in time acquiring greater audacity, 
admonish not only those to whom the admonition was applicable, but any others at the suggestion of their own avarice or ambition. And from 1356, when this law was made, to 1366, there had been admonished above 200 citizens. The captains of the parts and the sect of the Guelphs were thus become powerful, for every one honoured them for fear of being admonished, and most particularly the leaders, who were Piero degli Albizzi, Lapo da Castiglioncio, and Carlo Strozzi. This insolent mode of proceeding was offensive to many, but none felt so particularly injured with it as the Ricci, for they knew themselves to have occasioned it. They saw it involved the ruin of the Republic, and their enemies, the Albizzi, contrary to their intention, became great in consequence. On this account, Uguccione de Ricci, being one of the signory, resolved to put an end to the evil which he and his friends had originated, and with a new law provided that to the six captains of parts an additional three should be appointed, of whom two should be chosen from the companies of minor artificers, and that before any party could be declared Ghibelline, the declaration of the Capitani must be confirmed by twenty-four Guelphic citizens pointed for the purpose. This provision tempered for a time the power of the Capitani, so that the admonitions were greatly diminished, if not wholly laid aside. Still the parties of the Albizzi and the Ricci were continually on the alert to oppose each other's laws, deliberations and enterprises, not from a conviction of their inexpediency, but from a hatred of their promoters. In such distractions the time passed from 1366 to 1371, when the Guelphs again regained the ascendant. There was in the family of the Buon del Monte a gentleman named Benci, who, as an acknowledgment of his merit in a war against the Pisans, though one of the nobility, had been admitted among the people, and thus became eligible to office among the scenery. But when about to take his seat with them, a law was made that no nobleman who had been of the popular class should be allowed to assume that office. This gave great offence to Benci, who, in union with Piero degli Albizzi, determined to depress the less powerful of the popular party with admonitions, and obtain the government for themselves. By the interest which Benci possessed with the ancient nobility, and that of Piero with most of the influential citizens, the Guelphic party resumed their ascendancy, and by new reforms among the parts, so remodelled the administration, as to be able to dispose of the offices of the captains and the twenty-four citizens at pleasure. They then returned to the admonitions with greater audacity than ever, and the house of the Albizzi became powerful as the head of this faction. On the other hand, the Ricci made the most strenuous exertions against their designs, so that anxiety universally prevailed, and ruin was apprehended alike from both parties. In consequence of this, a great number of citizens, out of love to their country, assembled in the church of San Piero Scaraggio, and after a long consideration of the existing disorders, presented themselves before the signors, whom one of the principal among them addressed in the following terms. Many of us, magnificent signors, were afraid of meeting even for consideration of public business, without being publicly called together, lest we should be noted as presumptuous or condemned as ambitious. But seeing that so many citizens daily assemble in the lodges and halls of the palace, not for any public utility, but only for the gratification of their own ambition, we have thought that as those who assemble for the ruin of the Republic are fearless, so still less ought they to be apprehensive who meet together only for its advantage. Nor ought we to be anxious respecting the opinion they may form of our assembling, since they are so utterly indifferent to the opinion of others. Our affection for our country, magnificent seniors, caused us to assemble first, and now brings us before you to speak of grievances already great and daily increasing in our Republic, and to offer our assistance for their removal, and we doubt not that, though a difficult undertaking, it will still be attended with success, if you will lay aside all private regards, and authoritatively use the public force. The common corruption of all the cities of Italy, magnificent signors, has infested and still vitiates your own, for when this province had shaken off the imperial yoke, her cities not being subject to any powerful influence that might restrain them, administered affairs, not as free men do, but as a factious populace, and hence have arisen all the other evils and disorders that have appeared. In the first place, there cannot be found among the citizens either unity or friendship, except with those whose common guilt, 
either against their country or against private individuals, is a bond of union. And as the knowledge of religion and the fear of God seem to be alike extinct, oaths and promises have lost their validity, and are kept as long as it is found expedient. They are adopted only as a means of deception, and he is most applauded and respected whose cunning is most efficient and secure. On this account bad men are received with the approbation due to virtue, and good ones are regarded only in the light of fools. And certainly in the cities of Italy all that is corruptible and corrupting is assembled. The young are idle, the old lascivious, and each sex and every age abounds with debasing habits which the good laws, by misapplication, have lost the power to correct. Hence arises the avarice so observable among the citizens, and that greediness, not for true glory but for unworthy honours, from which follow hatred, animosities, quarrels and factions, resulting in deaths, banishments, affliction to all good men, and the advancement of the most unprincipled. For the good, confiding in their innocence, seek neither safety nor advancement by illegal methods as the wicked do, and thus unhonoured and undefended they sink into oblivion. From proceedings such as these arise at once the attachment for and influence of parties. Bad men follow them through ambition and avarice, and necessity compels the good to pursue the same course. And most lamentable it is to observe how the leaders and movers of parties sanctify their base designs with words that are all piety and virtue. They have the name of liberty constantly in their mouths, though their actions prove them her greatest enemies. The reward which they desire from victory is not the glory of having given liberty to the city, but the satisfaction of having vanquished others, and of making themselves rulers, and to attain their end there is nothing too unjust, too cruel, too avaricious for them to attempt. Thus laws and ordinances, peace, wars and treaties are adopted and pursued not for the public good, not for the common glory of the state, but for the convenience or advantage of a few individuals. And if other cities abound in these disorders, ours is more than any infected with them, for her laws, statutes and civil ordinances are not, nor have they ever been, established for the benefit of men in a state of freedom, but according to the wish of the faction that has been uppermost at the time. Hence it follows that, when one party is expelled, or a faction extinguished, another immediately arises. For in a city that is governed by parties rather than by laws, as soon as one becomes dominant and unopposed, it must of necessity soon divide against itself. For the private methods at first adapted for its defence will now no longer keep it united. The truth of this, both the ancient and modern dissensions of our city prove. Every one thought that when the Ghibellines were destroyed, the Guelphs would long continue happy and honoured. Yet after a short time they divided into the Bianchi and Neri, the black faction and the white. When the Bianchi were overcome, the city was not long free from factions, for either in favour of the emigrants, or in account of the animosity between the nobility and the people, we were still constantly at war. And as if resolved to give up to others what in mutual harmony we either would not or were unable to retain, we confided in the care of our precious liberty first to King Robert, then to his brother, next to his son, and at last to the Duke of Athens. Still we have never in any condition found repose, but seem like men who can neither agree to live in freedom nor be content with slavery. Nor did we hesitate, so greatly does the nature of our ordinances dispose us to division, while yet under our allegiance to the King, to substitute for His Majesty one of the vilest of men born at Agobio. For the credit of the city, the name of the Duke of Athens ought to be consigned to oblivion. His cruel and tyrannical disposition, however, might have taught us wisdom and instructed us how to live. But no sooner was he expelled than we handled our arms, and fought with more hatred and greater fury than we had ever done on any former occasion, so that the ancient nobility were vanquished, the city was left at the disposal of the people. It was generally supposed that no further occasion of quarrel or of party animosity could arise, since those whose pride and insupportable ambition had been regarded as the causes of them were depressed. However, experience proves how liable human judgment is to error, and what false impressions men imbibe, even in regard to the things that most intimately concern them. For we find the pride and ambition of the nobility are not extinct, but only transferred from them to the people who at this moment, according to the usual practice of ambitious men, are endeavouring to render themselves masters of the Republic and knowing that they have no chance of a success but what is offered by discord, they have again divided the city, and the names of Guelph and Ghibelline, which were beginning to be forgotten, and it would have been well if they had never been heard among us, 
are repeated anew in our ears. It seems almost necessarily ordained, in order that in human affairs there may be nothing either settled or permanent, that in all republics there are what may be called fatal families, born for the ruin of their country. Of this kind of pest our city has produced a more copious brood than any other, for not one but many have disturbed and harassed her. First the Buon del Monte and the Uberti, then the Donati and the Serti, and now, O oh ridiculous, O oh disgraceful thought, the Ricci and the Albizzi have caused a division of her citizens. We have not dwelt upon our corrupt habits, or our old and continuous dissensions to occasion you alarm, but to remind you of their causes, to show that as you doubtless are aware of them, we also keep them in view, and to remind you that their results ought not to make you diffident of your power to repress the disorders of the present time. The ancient families possessed so much influence, and were held in such high esteem, that civil force was insufficient to restrain them. But now, when the empire has lost its ascendancy, the Pope is no longer formidable, and the whole of Italy is reduced to a state of the most complete equality, there can be no difficulty. Our Republic might more especially than any other, although at first our former practices seem to present a reason to the contrary, not only keep itself united, but be improved by good laws and civil regulations. If you, the Signory, would once resolve to undertake the matter, and to this we, induced by no other motive than the love of our country, would most strongly urge you. It is true the corruption of the country is great, and much discretion will be requisite to correct it, but do not impute the past disorders to the nature of the men, but to the times, which being changed, give reasonable ground to hope that, with better government, our city will be attended with better fortune, for the malignity of the people will be overcome by restraining the ambition and annulling the ordinances of those who have encouraged faction, and adopting in their stead only such principles as are conformable to true civil liberty. And be assured that these desirable ends will be more certainly attained by the benign influence of the laws than by a delay which will compel the people to effect them by force and arms. The Signory, induced by the necessity of the case, of which they were previously aware, and further encouraged by the advice of those who now addressed them, gave authority to fifty-six citizens to provide for the safety of the Republic. It is usually found that most men are better adapted to pursue a good course already begun than to discover one applicable to immediate circumstances. These citizens thought rather of extinguishing existing factions than of preventing the formation of new ones, and effected neither of these objects. The facilities for the establishment of new parties were not removed, and out of those which they guarded against, another more powerful arose, which brought the Republic into still greater danger. They, however, deprived three of the family of the Albizzi, and three of that of the Ricci, of all the offices of government, except those of the Guelphic party, for three years. And among the deprived were Piero degli Albizzi and Uguccione de Ricci. They forbade the citizens to assemble in the palace except during the sittings of the Signory. They provided that if any one were beaten, or possession of his property detained from him, he might bring his case before the council and denounce the offender, even if he were one of the nobility, and that if it were proved, the accused should be subject to the usual penalties. This provision abated the boldness of the Ricci, and increased that of the Albizzi, since, although it applied equally to both, the Ricci suffered from it by far the most. For if Piero were excluded from the palace of the Signory, the chamber of the Guelphs, in which he possessed the greatest authority, remained open to him, and if he and his followers had previously been ready to admonish, they became after this injury doubly so. To this predisposition for evil, new excitements were added. End of Book 3, Chapter 1「3 Chapter 2 of History of Florence」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy Volume 1 by Niccolo Machiavelli Translator Unknown Book 3 Chapter 2 the war of the Florentines against the Pope's legate, and the causes of it. League against the Pope. The censures of the Pope disregarded in Florence. 
The city is divided into two factions, the one, the Capitani di Parte, the other of the eight commissioners of the war. Measures adopted by the Guelphic party against their adversaries. The Guelphs endeavour to prevent Salvestro de' Medici from being chosen gonfalonier, Salvestro de' Medici gonfalonier, his law against the nobility, and in favour of the Ammoniti. The Collegi disprove of the law. Salvestro addresses the council in its favour. The law is passed. Disturbances in Florence. The papal chair was occupied by Gregory the Eleventh. He, like his predecessors, residing at Avignon, governed Italy by legates who, proud and avaricious, oppressed many of the cities. One of these legates, then at Bologna, taking advantage of a great scarcity of food at Florence, endeavoured to render himself master of Tuscany, and not only withheld provisions from the Florentines, but in order to frustrate their hope of the future harvest, upon the approach of spring, attacked them with a large army, trusting that being famished and unarmed, he should find them an easy conquest. He might perhaps have been successful, had not his forces been mercenary and faithless, and, therefore, induced to abandon the enterprise for the sum of a hundred and thirty thousand florins, which the Florentines paid them. People may go to war when they will, but cannot always withdraw when they like. This contest, commenced by the ambition of the legate, was sustained by the resentment of the Florentines, who entered into a league with Bernabo of Milan, and with the cities hostile to the church, appointed eight citizens for the administration of it, giving them authority to act without appeal, and to expend whatever sums they might judge expedient, without rendering an account of the outlay. This war against the pontiff, though Uguccione was now dead, reanimated those who had followed the party of the Ricci, who in opposition to the Albizzi had always favoured Bernabo and opposed the church, and this the rather because the eight commissioners of war were all enemies of the Guelphs. This occasioned Piero degli Albizzi, Lapo da Costiglioncio, Carlo Strozzi and others to unite themselves more closely in opposition to their adversaries. The eight carried on the war, and the others admonished during three years when the death of the pontiff put an end to the hostilities which had been carried on with so much ability and with such entire satisfaction to the people that at the end of each year the eight were continued in office and were called santi or holy although they had set ecclesiastical censures at defiance plundered the churches of their property and compelled the priests to perform divine service so much did citizens at that time prefer the good of their country to their ghostly consolations, and thus showed the church that if as her friends they had defended, they could as enemies depress her, for the whole of Romagna, the Marches, and Perugia were excited to rebellion. Yet while this war was carried on against the Pope, they were unable to defend themselves against the captains of the parts and their faction, for the insolence of the Guelphs against the eight attained such a pitch that they could not restrain themselves from abusive behaviour, not merely against some of the most distinguished citizens, but even against the eight themselves, and the captains of the parts conducted themselves with such arrogance that they were feared more than the seniory. Those who had business with them treated them with greater reverence, and their court was held in higher estimation, so that no ambassador came to Florence without commission to the captains. Pope Gregory being dead, and the city freed from external war, there still prevailed great confusion within, for the audacity of the Guelphs was insupportable, and as no available mode of subduing them presented itself, it was thought that recourse must be had to arms, to determine which party was the strongest. With the Guelphs were all the ancient nobility, and the greater part of the most popular leaders, of which number, as already remarked, were Lapo, Piero, and Carlo. On the other side were all the lower orders, the leaders of whom were the eight commissioners of war, Giorgio Scali and Tommaso Strozzi, and with them the Ricci, Alberti, and Medici. The rest of the multitude, as most commonly happens, joined the discontented party. It appeared to the heads of the Guelphic faction that their enemies would be greatly strengthened, and themselves in considerable danger in case a hostile seigneury should resolve on their subjugation. Desirous, therefore, of being prepared against this calamity, the leaders of the party assembled to take into consideration the state of the city and that of their own friends in particular, and found the Ammoniti so numerous and so great a difficulty that the whole city was excited against them on this account. They could not devise any other remedy than 
that as their enemies had deprived them of all the offices of honour, they should banish their opponents from the city, take possession of the palace of the Signory, and bring over the whole state to their own party, in imitation of the Guelphs of former times, who found no safety in the city, till they had driven all their adversaries out of it. They were unanimous upon the main point, but did not agree upon the time of carrying it into execution. It was in the month of April, in the year 1378, when Lapo, thinking delay inadvisable, expressed his opinion that procrastination was in the highest degree perilous to themselves. As in the next signory, Salvestro de' Medici would very probably be elected gonfalonier, and they all knew he was opposed to their party. Piero degli Albizzi, on the other hand, thought it better to defer, since they would require forces which could not be assembled without exciting observation, and if they were discovered, they would incur great risk. He thereupon judged it preferable to wait till the approaching feast of St. John, on which, being the most solemn festival of the city, vast multitudes would be assembled, among whom they might conceal whatever numbers they pleased. To obviate their fears of Salvestro, he was to be admonished, and if this did not appear likely to be effectual, they would admonish one of the colleague of his quarter, and upon redrawing, as the ballot-boxes would be nearly empty, chance would very likely occasion that either he or some associate of his would be drawn, and he would thus be re rendered incapable of sitting as gonfalonier. They therefore came to the conclusion, proposed by Piero, though Lapo consented reluctantly, considering the delay dangerous, and that as no opportunity can be in all respects suitable, he who waits for the concurrence of every advantage, either never makes an attempt, or, if induced to do so, is most frequently foiled. They admonished the colleague, but did not prevent the appointment of Silvestro, for the design was discovered by the eight, who took care to render all attempts upon the drawing futile. Salvestro Alamano de' Medici was therefore drawn gonfalonier, and, being one of the noblest popular families, he could not endure that the people should be oppressed by a few powerful persons. Having resolved to put an end to their insolence, and perceiving the middle classes favourably disposed, and many of the highest people on his side, he communicated his design to Benedetto Alberti, Tommaso Strozzi, and Giorgio Scali, who all promised their assistance. They therefore secretly drew up a law which had for its object to revive the restrictions upon the nobility, to retrench the authority of the Capitani di Parte, and to recall the Ammoniti to their dignity. In order to attempt and obtain their ends at one and the same time, having to consult first the colleagues and then the councils, Silvestro being provost, which office for the time makes it possessor almost prince of the city, he called together the colleagues and the council on the same morning, and the colleagues being apart, he proposed the law prepared by himself and his friends, which, being a novelty, encountered in their smaller number so much opposition that he was unable to have it passed. Silvestro, seeing his first attempt likely to fail, pretended to leave the room for a private reason, and, without being perceived, went immediately to the council, and taking a lofty position from which he could be both seen and heard, said, that considering himself invested with the office of Gonfalonia, not so much to preside in private cases, for which proper judges were appointed, who have their regular sittings, as to guard the state, correct the insolence of the powerful, and ameliorate those laws by the influence of which the republic was being ruined. He had carefully attended to both these duties, and to his utmost ability provided for them, but found the perversity of some so much opposed to his just designs as to deprive him of all opportunity of doing good, and them not only of the means of assisting him with their counsel, but even hearing him. Therefore, finding he no longer contributed either to the benefit of the Republic or of the people generally, he could not perceive any reason for his longer holding the magistracy, of which he was either undeserving or others thought him so, and would therefore retire to his house, that the people might appoint another in his stead, who would either have greater virtue or better fortune than himself, and having said this, he left the room as if to return home. Those of the council who were in the secret, and others desirous of novelty, raised a tumult, at which the signory and the colleagues came together, and finding the gonfalonia leaving them, entreatingly and authoritatively detained him, and obliged him to return to the council room, which was now full of confusion. Many of the noble citizens were threatened in opprobrious language, and an artificer seized Carlo Strozzi by the throat, and would undoubtedly have murdered him, but was with difficulty prevented by those around. 
he who made the greatest disturbance and incited the city to violence was benedetto degli alberti who from a window of the palace loudly called the people to arms and presently the courtyards were filled with armed men and the colleagues granted to threats what they had refused to entreaty the capitani di parti had at the same time drawn together a great number of citizens to their hall to consult upon the means of defending themselves against the order of the signors but when they heard the tumult that was raised and were informed of the course the councils had adopted each took refuge in his own house let no one when raising popular commotions imagine he can afterward control them at his pleasure or restrain them from proceeding to the commission of violence Salvestro intended to enact his law and compose the city, but it happened otherwise, for the feelings of all had become so excited that they shut up the shops. The citizens fortified themselves in their houses, many conveyed their valuable property into the churches and monasteries, and every one seemed to apprehend something terrible at hand. The companies of the arts met, and each appointed an additional officer or syndic, upon which the priors summoned their colleagues and these syndics and consulted a whole day how the city might be appeased with satisfaction to the different parties but much difference of opinion prevailed and no conclusion was come to on the following day the arts brought forth their banners which the sinewy understanding and being apprehensive of evil called the council together to consider what course to adopt but scarcely were they met when the uproar recommenced and soon the ensigns of the arts surrounded by vast numbers of armed men, occupied the courts. Upon this the council, to give the arts and the people hope of redress, and free themselves as much as possible from the charge of causing the mischief, gave a general power, which in Florence is called Belia, to the signors, the colleagues, the eight, the capitani di parti, and to the syndics of the arts, to reform the government of the city, for the common benefit of all. While this was being arranged, a few of the ensigns of the arts and some of the mob, desirous of avenging themselves for the recent injuries they had received from the Guelphs, separated themselves from the rest, and sacked and burnt the house of Lapo di Castiglioncio, who, when he learnt the proceedings of the sinuary against the Guelphs, and saw the people in arms, having no other resource but concealment or flight, first took refuge in Santa Croce, and afterwards, being disguised as a monk, fled into the Casentino, where he was often heard to blame himself for having consented to wait till St. John's Day, before they had made themselves sure of the government. Piero degli Albizzi and Carlo Strozzi hid themselves upon the first outbreak of the tumult, trusting that when it was over, by the interest of their numerous friends and relations, they might remain safely in Florence. The house of Lapo being burnt, as mischief begins with difficulty but easily increases, Many other houses, either through public hatred or private malice, shared the same fate, and the rioters, that they might have companions more eager than themselves to assist them in their work of plunder, broke open the public prisons, and then sacked the monastery of the Agnoli and the convent of San Spirito, whither many citizens had taken their most valuable goods for safety. Nor would the public chambers have escaped the destroyer's hands, except out of reverence for one of the signors, who on horseback, and followed by many citizens in arms, opposed the rage of the mob. End of Book 3, Chapter 2 Book 3, Chapter 3 of History of Florence This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1 by Niccolo Machiavelli, translator unknown. Book Three, Chapter Three. Contrary measures adopted by the magistrates to effect a pacification. Luigi Guicciardini, the Gonfalonier, entreats the magistrates of the arts to endeavor to pacify the people. Serious riot caused by the plebeians. The woolen art. The plebeians assemble. The speech of a seditious plebeian. Their resolution thereupon. The signory discover the designs of the plebeians, measures adopted to counteract them. This popular fury being abated by the authority of the signors and the approach of night, on the following day the balia received the admonished on condition that they should not, for three years, be capable of holding any magistracy. They annulled the laws made by the Guelphs to the prejudice of the citizens, declared Lapo de Castiglianchio and his companions rebels, and with them many others 
who were the objects of universal detestation. After these resolutions, the new seigneury were drawn for, and Luigi Guicciardini appointed Gonfalonier, which gave hope that the tumults would soon be appeased, for every one thought them to be peaceable men and lovers of order. Still the shops were not opened, nor did the citizens lay down their arms, but continued to patrol the city in great numbers, so that the seigneury did not assume the magistracy with the usual pomp, but merely assembled within the palace, omitting all ceremony. The seigneury, considering nothing more advisable in the beginning of their magistracy than to restore peace, caused a relinquishment of arms, ordered the shops to be opened, and the strangers who had been called to their aid to return to their homes. They appointed guards in many parts of the city, so that if the admonished would only have remained quiet, order would soon have been re-established. But they were not satisfied to wait three years for the recovery of their honours, so that to gratify them the arts again met, and demanded of the seigneury, that for the benefit and quiet of the city they would ordain that no citizens should, at any time, whether senior, colleague, capitano di parte, or consul of any art, whatever, be admonished as a ghibelline, and further, that new ballots of the Guelphic party should be made, and the old ones burned. These demands were at once acceded to, not only by the seniors, but by all the councils, and thus it was hoped that the tumults newly excited would be settled. But since men are not satisfied with recovering what is their own, but wish to possess the property of others and to revenge themselves, those who were in hopes of benefiting by these disorders persuaded the artificers that they would never be safe, if several of their enemies were not expelled from the city or destroyed. This terrible doctrine coming to the knowledge of the seigneury, they caused the magistrates of the arts and their syndics to be brought before them, and Luigi Guicciardini, the Gonfalonier, addressed them in the following words. If these seniors, and I with them, had not been long acquainted with the fate of this city, that as soon as external wars have ceased the internal commerce, we should have been more surprised, and our displeasure would have been greater. But as evils to which we are accustomed are less annoying, we have endured past disturbances patiently, they having arisen for the most part without our fault, and we hoped that, like former troubles, they would soon have an end, after the many and great concessions we had made at your suggestion. But finding that you are yet unsettled, that you contemplate the commission of new crimes against your fellow-citizens, and are desirous of making new exiles, our displeasure increases in proportion to your misconduct. And certainly, could we have believed that during our magistracy the city was to be ruined, whether with or without your concurrence, we should certainly, either by flight or exile, have avoided these horrors. But trusting that we had to do with those who possessed some feelings of humanity and some love of their country, we willingly accepted the magistracy, thinking that, by our gentleness, we should overcome your ambition. But we perceive from experience that the more humble our behaviour, the more concessions we make, the prouder you become, and the more exorbitant are your demands. And though we speak thus, it is not in order to offend, but to amend you. Let others tell you pleasing tales. Our design is to communicate only what is for your good. Now we would ask you, and have you answer on your honour, what is there yet ungranted that you can, with any appearance of propriety, require? You wish to have authority taken from the Capitani di Parti, and it is done. You wished that the balloting should be burned, and a reformation of them take place, and we consent. You desired that the admonished should be restored to their honours, and it is permitted. At your entreaty we have pardoned those who have burned down houses and plundered churches, many honourable citizens have been exiled to please you, and at your suggestion new restraints have been laid upon the great. When will there be an end of your demands? And how long will you continue to abuse our liberality? Do you not observe with how much more moderation we bear defeat than you your victory? To what end will your divisions bring our city? Have you forgotten that when disunited Castruccio, a low citizen of Lucca, subdued her? Or that a duke of Athens, your hired captain, did so too? But when the citizens were united in her defence, an archbishop of Milan and a pope were unable to subdue it, and after many years of war were compelled to retire with disgrace. Then why would you, by your discords, reduce to slavery in a time of peace, that city, which so many powerful enemies have left free, even in war? 
what can you expect from your disunion but subjugation, or from the property of which you have already plundered, or may yet plunder us, but poverty? For this property is the means by which we furnish occupation for the whole city, and if you take it from us, our means of finding that occupation is withdrawn. Besides, those who take it will have difficulty in preserving what is dishonestly acquired, and thus poverty and destitution are brought upon the city. Now I, and these seniors command, and if it were consistent with propriety, we would entreat you, that you allow your minds to be calmed, be content, rest satisfied with the provisions that have been made for you, and if you should be found to need anything further, make your request with decency and order, not with tumult, for when your demands are reasonable they will always be complied with, and you will not give occasion to evil, designing men to ruin your country, and cast the blame upon yourselves. These words, conveying nothing but the truth, produced a suitable effect upon the minds of the citizens, who, thanking the Gonfalonier for having acted toward them the part of a king senior, and toward the city that of a good citizen, offered their obedience in whatever might be committed to them. And the seniors, to prove the sincerity of their intentions, appointed two citizens for each of the superior magistracies, who, with syndics of the arts, were to consider what could be done to restore quite, and report their resolutions to the seniors. While these things were in progress, a disturbance arose, much more injurious to the Republic than anything that had hitherto occurred. The greatest part of the fires and robberies which took place on the previous days were perpetrated by the very lowest of the people, and those who had been the most audacious were afraid that when the greater differences were composed, they would be punished for the crimes they had committed, and that, as usual, they would be abandoned by those who had instigated them to the commission of crime. To this may be added, the hatred of the lower orders toward the richer citizens and the principles of the arts, because they did not think themselves remunerated for their labor in a manner equal to their merits. From the time of Charles I, when the city was divided into arts, a head or governor was appointed to each, and it was provided that the individuals of each art should be judged in civil matters by their own superiors. These arts, as we have before observed, were at first twelve, in the course of time they were increased to twenty-one, and attained so much power, that in a few years they grasped the entire government of the city, and as some were in greater esteem than others, they were divided into major and minor. Seven were called major, and fourteen the minor arts. From this division, and from other causes which we have narrated above, arose the arrogance of the Capitani di Parti, for those citizens who had formerly been Guelphs, and had the constant disposal of the magistracy, favoured the followers of the major, and persecuted the minor arts and their patrons, and hence arose the many commotions already mentioned. When the companies of the arts were first organised, many of those trades, followed by the lowest of the people and the plebeians, were not incorporated, but were ranged under those arts most nearly allied to them, and hence, when they were not properly remunerated for their labour, or their masters oppressed them, they had no one of whom to seek redress, except the magistrate of the art to which theirs was subject, and of him they did not think justice always attainable. Of the arts, that which had always been, and now has, the greatest number of these subordinates is the woollen, which, being both thin and still the most powerful body, and first in authority, supports the greater part of the plebeians and lowest of the people. The lower classes, then, the subordinates not only of the woollen, but also of the other arts, were discontented, from the causes just mentioned, and their apprehension of punishment for the burnings and robberies they had committed, did not tend to compose them. Meetings took place in different parts during the night, to talk over the past, and to communicate the danger in which they were, when one of the most daring and experienced, in order to animate the rest, spoke thus. If the question now were, whether we should take up arms, rob and burn the houses of citizens, and plunder churches, I am one of those who would think it worthy of further consideration, and should, perhaps, prefer poverty and safety to the dangerous pursuit of an uncertain good. But as we have already armed, and many offences have been committed, it appears to me that we have to consider how to lay them aside, and secure ourselves from the consequences of what is already done. I certainly think, that if nothing else could teach us, necessity might. You see the whole city full of complaint and indignation against us, the citizens are closely united, and the seniors are constantly with the magistrates. You may be sure they are contriving something against us, they are arranging some new plan to subdue us. 
We ought, therefore, to keep two things in view, and have two points to consider. The one is, to escape with impunity for what has been done during the last few days, and the other, to live in greater comfort and security for the time to come. We must, therefore, I think, in order to be pardoned for our faults, commit new ones, redoubling the mischief, and multiplying the fires and robberies, and in doing this, endeavour to have as many companions as we can, for when many are in fault, few are punished. Small crimes are chastened, but great and serious ones rewarded. When many suffer, few seek vengeance, for general evils are endured more patiently than private ones. To increase the number of misdeeds will, therefore, make forgiveness more easily attainable, and will open the way to secure what we require for our own liberty. And it appears evident that the gain is certain, for our opponents are disunited and rich, their disunion will give us the victory, and their riches, when they have become ours, will support us. Be not deceived about that antiquity of blood, by which they exalt themselves above us, for all men having had one common origin, they are all equally ancient, and nature has made us all after one fashion. Strip us naked, and we shall be found alike. Dress us in their clothing, and they in ours, we shall appear noble, they ignoble for poverty and riches make all the difference. It grieves me much to think that some of you are sorry inwardly for what is done, and resolve to abstain from anything more of the kind. Certainly, if it be so, you are not the men I took you for, because neither shame nor conscience ought to have any influence with you. Conquerors, by what means soever, are never considered aught but glorious. We have no business to think about conscience, for when, like us, men have to fear hunger and imprisonment or death, the fear of hell neither can nor ought to have any influence upon them. If you only notice human proceedings, you may observe that all who attain great power and riches make use of either fraud or force, and what they have acquired, either by deceit or violence, in order to conceal the disgraceful methods of attainment, they endeavour to sanctify with the false title of honest gains." Those who either from imprudence or want of sagacity avoid doing so, are always overwhelmed with servitude and poverty, for faithful servants are always servants, and honest men are always poor. Nor do any ever escape from servitude but the bold and faithless, or from poverty but the rapacious and fraudulent. God and nature have thrown all human fortunes into the midst of mankind, and they are thus attainable rather by rapine than by industry, by wicked actions rather than by good. Hence it is that men feed upon each other, and those who cannot defend themselves must be worried. Therefore, we must use force when the opportunity offers, and fortune cannot present us one more favourable than the present, when the citizens are still disunited, the seniory doubtful, and the magistrates terrified, for we may easily conquer them before they can come to any settled agreement. By this means we shall either obtain the entire government of the city, or so large a share of it, as to be forgiven past errors, and have sufficient authority to threaten the city with a renewal of them at some future time. I confess this course is bold and dangerous, but when necessity presses, audacity becomes prudence, and in great affairs the brave never think of dangers. The enterprises that are begun with hazard always have a reward at last, and no one ever escaped from embarrassment without some peril. Besides, it is easy to see from all their preparations of prisons, racks, and instruments of death, that there is more danger in inaction than in endeavouring to secure ourselves, for in the first case the evils are certain, in the latter doubtful. How often have I heard you complain of the avarice of your superiors, and the injustice of your magistrates! Now, then, is the time, not only to liberate yourself from them, but to become so much superior, that they will have more causes of grief and fear from you, than you from them. The opportunity presented by circumstance passes away, and when gone, it will be vain to think it can be recalled. You see the preparations of our enemies, let us anticipate them, and those who are first in arms will certainly be victors, to the ruin of their enemies, and their own exultation, and thus honours will accrue to many of us, and security to all. These arguments greatly inflamed minds already disposed to mischief, so that they determined to take up arms as soon as they had acquired a sufficient number of associates, and bound themselves by oath to mutual defence, in case any of them were subdued by the civil power. While they were arranging to take possession of the republics, their design became known to the seigniory, who, having taken a man named Simon, 
learned from him the particulars of the conspiracy, and that the outbreak was to take place on the following day. Finding the danger so pressing, they called together the colleagues and those citizens who, with the syndics of the arts, were endeavouring to effect the union of the city. It was then evening, and they advised the seniors to assemble the consuls of the trades, who proposed that whatever armed force was in Florence should be collected, and with the gonfaloniers of the people and their companies, meet under arms in the piazza next morning. It happened that, while Simone was being tortured, a man named Niccolò de San Friano was regulating the palace clock, and becoming acquainted with what was going on, returned home and spread the report of it in his neighbourhood, so that presently the piazza of St. Spirito was occupied by above a thousand men. This soon became known to the other conspirators, and San Pietro Maggiore and St. Lorenzo, their places of assembly, were presently full of them, all under arms. End of Book Three, Chapter Three Book Three, Chapter Four of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolo Machiavelli. Translator Unknown. Book Three, Chapter Four Proceedings of the Plebeians. The Demand They Make of the Signory. They insist that the signory leaves the palace. The signory leave the palace. Michael de Lando, Gonfalier. Complaints and movements of the plebeians against Michael de Lando. Michael de Lando proceeds against the plebeians and reduces them to order. Character of Michael de Lando. At daybreak of the 21st of July, there did not appear in the piazza above eighty men in arms friendly to the signory, and not one of the Gonfaliers for knowing the whole city to be in a state of insurrection they were afraid to leave their homes. The first body of plebeians that made its appearance was that which had assembled at San Pietro Maggiore, but the armed force did not venture to attack them. Then came the other multitudes, and finding no opposition, they loudly demanded their prisoners from the signory, and being resolved to have them by force if they were not yielded to their threats, they burned the house of Luigi Guicciardini and the signory, for fear of greater mischief, set them at liberty. With this addition to their strength they took the gonfalon of justice from the bearer, and under the shadow of authority which it gave them, burned the houses of many citizens, selecting those whose owners had publicly or privately excited their hatred. Many citizens, to avenge themselves for private injuries, conducted them to the houses of their enemies, for it was quite sufficient to ensure its destruction, if a single voice from the mob crawled out, to the house of such a one, or if he who bore the gonfalon took the road toward it. All the documents belonging to the woolen trade were burned, and after the commission of much violence, by way of associating it with something laudable, Salvestro de' Medici and sixty-three other citizens were made knights, among whom were Benedetto and Antonio degli Alberti, Tommaso Strozzi, and others, similarly their friends, though many received the honour against their wills. It was a remarkable peculiarity of the riots, that many who had their houses burned were on the same day and by the same party made knights, so close were the kindness and the injury together. This circumstance occurred to Luigi Guicciardini, gonfalonier of justice. In this tremendous uproar, the signory, finding themselves abandoned by their armed force, by the leaders of the arts, and by the gonfaloniers, became dismayed, for none had come to their assistance in obedience to orders, and of the sixteen gonfalons, the ensign of the Golden Lion and of the Veo, under Giovenco della Struffa and Giovanni Cambi alone appeared, and these, not being joined by any other, soon withdrew. Of the citizens, on the other hand, some, seeing the fury of this unreasonable multitude and the palace abandoned, remained within doors. Others followed the armed mob, in the hope that, by being among them, they might more easily protect their own houses or those of their friends. The power of the plebeians was thus increased, and that of the scenery weakened. The tumult continued all day, and at night the rioters halted near the palace of Stefano, behind the church of St. Barnabas. Their number exceeded six thousand, and before daybreak they obtained by threats the ensigns of the trades, with which, and the gonfalon of justice, when morning came, they proceeded to the palace of the provost, who, refusing to surrender it to them, they took possession of it by force. 
The seniory, desirous of a compromise, since they could not restrain them by force, appointed four of the colleagues to proceed to the palace of the provost, and endeavour to learn what was their intention. They found that the leaders of the plebeians, with the syndics of the trades and some citizens, had resolved to signify their wishes to the seniory. They therefore returned with four deputies of the plebeians, who demanded that the woollen trade should not be allowed to have a foreign judge, that there should be formed three new companies of the arts, namely, one for the wool-combers and dyers, one for the barbers, doublet-makers, tailors, and such like, and the third for the lowest class of people. They required that the three new arts should furnish two seniors, the fourteen minor arts three, and that the seniory should provide a suitable place of assembly for them. They also made it a condition that no member of these companies should be expected during two years to pay any debt that amounted to less than fifty ducats, that the bank should take no interest on loans already contracted, and that only the principal sum should be demanded, that the condemned and the banished should be forgiven, and the admonished should be restored to participation in the honours of government. Besides these, many other articles were stipulated in favour of their friends, and a requisition made that many of their enemies should be exiled and admonished. These demands, though grievous and dishonourable to the Republic, were for fear of further violence granted, by the joint deliberation of the seniors, colleagues, and council of the people. But in order to give it full effect, it was requisite that the council of the commune should also give its consent, and as they could not assemble two councils during the same day, it was necessary to defer it till the morrow. However, the trades appeared content, the plebeians satisfied, and both promised, that these laws being confirmed, every disturbance should cease. On the following morning, while the council of the commune were in consultation, the impatient and volatile multitude entered the piazza, under their respective ensigns, with loud and fearful shouts, which struck terror into all the council and seniory, and Guerente Magnoli, one of the latter, influenced more by fear than anything else, under pretense of guarding the lower doors, left the chamber and fled to his house. He was unable to conceal himself from the multitude, who, however, took no notice, except that upon seeing him they insisted that all the seniors should quit the palace, and declared that if they refused to comply, their houses should be burned and their families put to death. The law had now been passed, the seniors were in their own apartments, the council had descended from the chamber, and without leaving the palace, hopeless of saving the city, they remained in the lodges and courts below, overwhelmed with grief at seeing such depravity in the multitude, and such perversity or fear in those who might either have restrained or suppressed them. The seniory, too, were dismayed and fearful for the safety of their country, finding themselves abandoned by one of their associates, and without any aid or even advice, when at this moment of uncertainty as to what was about to happen, or what would be best to be done, Tommaso Strozzi and Benedetto Alberti, either from motives of ambition, being desirous of remaining masters of the palace, or because they thought it the most advisable step, persuaded them to give way to the popular impulse, and withdraw privately to their homes. This advice, given by those who had been the leaders of the tumult, although the others yielded, filled Alamano, Acquiagioli, and Niccolo del Bene, two of the seniors, with anger. And, reassuming a little vigour, they said that if the others would withdraw they could not help it, but they would remain as long as they continued in office, if they did not in the meantime lose their lives. These dissensions redoubled the fears of the seniory and the rage of the people, so that the gonfalier, disposed rather to conclude his magistracy in dishonour than in danger, recommended himself to the care of Tommaso Strozzi, who withdrew him from the palace and conducted him to his house. The other seniors were, one after another, conveyed in the same manner, so that Alamano and Niccolo, not to appear more valiant than wise, seeing themselves left alone, also retired and the palace fell into the hands of the plebeians and the eight commissioners of war, who had not yet laid down their authority. When the plebeians entered the palace, the standard of the gonfalonier of justice was in the hands of Michael de Lando, a woolcomber. This man, barefoot, with scarcely anything upon him, and the rabble at his heels, ascended the staircase, and having entered the audience-chamber of the seigneury, he stopped, and turning to the multitude, said, "'You see this palace is now yours, and the city is in your power.' what do you think ought to be done? To which they replied, that they would have him for their gonfalier and lord, and that he should govern them and the city as he thought best. Michael accepted the command, and as he was a cool and sagacious man, more favoured by nature than by fortune, 
he resolved to compose the tumult, and restore peace to the city. To occupy the minds of the people, and to give himself time to make some arrangement, he ordered that one Nutto, who had been appointed Bargello, or sheriff, by Lapo de Castiglionchio, should be sought. The greater part of his followers went to execute this command, and to commence with justice the government he had acquired by favour, he commanded that no one should either burn or steal anything, while to strike terror into all, he caused a gallows to be erected in the court of the palace. He began the reform of government by deposing the syndics of the trades, and appointing new ones. He deprived the seigneury and the colleagues of their magistracy, and burned the balloting purses containing the names of those eligible to office under the former government. In the meantime, Ser Nutto, being brought by the mob into the court, was suspended from the gallows by one foot, and those around, having torn him to pieces, in little more than a moment nothing remained of him but that foot by which he had been tied. The eight commissioners of war, on the other hand, thinking themselves, after the departure of the seniors, left sole masters of the city, had already formed a new seigneury. But Michael, on hearing this, sent them an order to quit the palace immediately, for he wished to show that he could govern Florence without their assistance. He then assembled the syndics of the trades, and created as a seigneury, four from the lowest plebeians, two from the major, and two from the minor trades. Besides this, he made a new selection of names for the balloting purses, and divided the state into three parts, one composed of the new trades, another of the minor, and the third of the major trades. He gave to Salvestro de' Medici the revenue of the shops upon the old bridge. For himself he took the provostry of Empoli, and conferred benefits upon many other citizens, friends of the plebeians, not so much for the purpose of rewarding their labours, as that they might serve to screen him from envy. It seemed to the plebeians that Michael, in his reformation of the state, had too much favoured the higher ranks of the people, and that themselves had not a sufficient share in the government to enable them to preserve it, and hence, prompted by their usual audacity, they again took arms, and coming tumultuously into the court of the palace, each body under their particular ensigns, insisted that the seigneury should immediately descend and consider new means for advancing their well-being and security. Michael, observing their arrogance, was unwilling to provoke them, but without further yielding to their request, blamed the manner in which it was made, and advised them to lay down their arms, and promised that then would be conceded to them what otherwise, for the dignity of the state, must of necessity be withheld. The multitude, enraged at this reply, withdrew to Santa Maria Novella, where they appointed eight leaders for their party, with officers and other regulations to ensure influence and respect, so that the city possessed two governments, and was now under the direction of two distinct powers. These new leaders determined that eight, elected from their trades, should constantly reside in the palace with the seigneury, and that whatever the seigneury should determine must be confirmed by them before it became law. They took from Salvestro de' Medici and Michael de Lando the whole of what their former decrees had granted them, and distributed to many of their party offices and emoluments to enable them to support their dignity. These resolutions being passed, to render them valid they sent two of their body to the seigneury, to insist on their being confirmed by the council, with an intimation that if not granted they would be vindicated by force. This deputation, with amazing audacity and surpassing presumption, explained their commission to the seigneury, upbraided the gonfalonier with the dignity they had conferred upon him, the honour they had done him, and with the ingratitude and want of respect he had shown toward them. Coming to threats toward the end of their discourse, Michael could not endure their arrogance, and sensible rather of the dignity of the office he held than of the meanness of his origin, determined by extraordinary means to punish such extraordinary insolence, and drawing the sword with which he was girt, seriously wounded, and caused them to be seized and imprisoned. When the fact became known, the multitude were filled with rage, and thinking that by their arms they might ensure what without them they had failed to effect, they seized their weapons and with the utmost fury resolved to force the seigneury to consent to their wishes. Michael, suspecting what would happen, determined to be prepared, for he knew his credit rather required him to be the first to attack than to await the approach of the enemy, or, like his predecessors, dishonour both the palace and himself by flight. He therefore drew together a good number of citizens, for many began to see their error, mounted on horseback, and followed by crowds of armed men, proceeded to Santa Maria Novella, to encounter his adversaries. The plebeians, who as before observed were influenced by a similar desire, 
had set out about the same time as Michael, and it happened that, as each took a different route, they did not meet in their way, and Michael, upon his return, found the piazza in their possession. The contest was now for the palace, and joining in the fight, he soon vanquished them, drove part of them out of the city, and compelled the rest to throw down their arms and escape or conceal themselves, as well as they could. Having thus gained the victory, the tumults were composed, solely by the talents of the gonfalonier, who in courage, prudence, and generosity surpassed every other citizen of his time, and deserves to be enumerated among the glorious few who have greatly benefited their country, for had he possessed either malice or ambition, the republic would have been completely ruined, and the city must have fallen under great tyranny, and the city must have fallen under greater tyranny than that of the Duke of Athens. But his goodness never allowed a thought to enter his mind opposed to the universal welfare. His prudence enabled him to conduct affairs in such a manner, that a great majority of his own faction reposed the most entire confidence in him, and he kept the rest in awe by the influence of his authority. These qualities subdued the plebeians, and opened the eyes of the superior artificers, who considered how great must be the folly of those, who, having overcome the pride of the nobility, could endure to submit to the nauseous rule of the rabble. End of chapter 3, book 4《Book Three, Chapter Five of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator Unknown. Book Three, Chapter Five. New Regulations for the Elections of the Signory. Confusion in the City. Piero degli Abizzi and other citizens contempt to death. The Florentines alarmed by the approach of Charles of Durazzo. The measures adopted in consequence thereof. Insolent conduct of Giorgio Scali, Benedetto Alberti, Giorgio Scali beheaded. By the time Michael de Lando had subdued the plebeians, the new seigneury was drawn, and among those who composed it were two persons of such base and mean condition that the desire increased in the minds of the people to be freed from the ignominy into which they had fallen, and when, upon the first of September, the new seigneury entered office, and the retiring members were still in the palace, the piazza being full of armed men, a tumultuous cry arose from the midst of them, that none of the lowest of the people should hold office among the seigneury. The obnoxious two were withdrawn accordingly. The name of one was Iltira, of the other Baraccio, and in their stead were elected Giorgio Scali and Francesco di Micheli. The company of the lowest trade was also dissolved, and its members deprived of office, except Michael de Lando, Lorenzo di Puccio, and a few others of better quality. The honors of government were divided into two parts, one of which was assigned to the superior trades, the other to the inferior, except that the latter were to furnish five seniors, and the former only four. The gonfalonier was to be chosen alternately from each. The government thus composed restored peace to the city for the time, but though the republic was rescued from the power of the lowest plebeians, the inferior trades were still more influential than the nobles of the people, who, however, were obliged to submit for the gratification of the trades, of whose favor they wished to deprive the plebeians. The new establishment was supported by all who wished the continued subjugation of those who, under the name of the Guelphic party, had practised such excessive violence against the citizens. And as among others, thus disposed, were Giorgio Scali, Benedetto Alberti, Salvestro di Medici, and Tommaso Strozzi. These four almost became princes of the city. This state of the public mind strengthened the divisions already commenced between the nobles of the people and the minor artificers by the ambition of the Ricci and the Albizzi, from which, as at different times very serious effects arose, and as they will hereafter be frequently mentioned, we shall call the former the popular party, the latter the plebeian. This condition of things continued three years, during which many were exiled and put to death, for the government lived in constant apprehension, knowing that both within and without the city many were dissatisfied with them. Those within, either attempted or were suspected of attempting, every day some new project against them, those without, being under no restraint, were continually, by means of some prince or republic, spreading reports tending to increase the disaffection. 
Gianozzo de Salerno was at this time in Bologna. He held a command under Charles of Durazzo, a descendant of the kings of Naples, who, designing to undertake the conquest of the dominions of Queen Giovanna, retained his captain in that city, with the concurrence of Pope Urban, who was at enmity with the Queen. Many Florentine emigrants were also at Bologna, in close correspondence with him and Charles. This caused the rulers in Florence to live in continual alarm, and induced them to lend a willing ear to any calumnies against the suspected. While in this disturbed state of feeling, it was disclosed to the government that Giannozzo de Salerno was about to march to Florence with the emigrants, and that great numbers of those within were to rise in arms, and deliver the city to him. Upon this information many were accused, the principal of whom were Piero degli Albizzi and Carlo Strozzi, after those Cipriano Mangioni, Jacopo Cecchetti, Donato Barbadori, Filippo Strozzi, and Giovanni Anselmi, the whole of whom, except Carlo Strozzi who fled, were made prisoners, and the signory, to prevent any one from taking arms in their favour, appointed Tommozzo Strozzi and Benedetto Alberti, with a strong armed force, to guard the city. The arrested citizens were examined, and although nothing was elicited against them sufficient to induce the Capitano to find them guilty, their enemies excited the minds of the populace to such a degree of outrageous and overwhelming fury against them, that they were contemned to death, as it were, by force. Nor was the greatness of his family, or his former reputation of any service to Piero degli Albizzi, who had once been, of all the citizens, the man most feared and honoured. Some one, either as a friend to render him wise in his prosperity, or an enemy to threaten him with the fickleness of fortune, had upon the occasion of his making a feast for many citizens, sent him a silver bowl full of sweetmeats, among which a large nail was found, and being seen by many present, was taken for a hint to him to fix the wheel of fortune, which, having conveyed him to the top, must, if the rotation continued, also bring him to the bottom. This interpretation was verified, first by his ruin, and afterward by his death. After this execution the city was full of consternation, for both victors and vanquished were alike in fear. But the worst effects arose from the apprehensions of those possessing the management of affairs, for every accident, however trivial, caused them to commit fresh outrages, either by condemnations, admonitions, or banishment of citizens, to which must be added, as scarcely less pernicious, the frequent new laws and regulations which were made for the defence of the government, all of which were put in execution to the injury of those opposed to their faction. They appointed forty-six persons, who, with the seniory, were to purge the republic of all suspected by the government. They admonished thirty-nine citizens, ennobled many of the people, and degraded many nobles to the popular rank. To strengthen themselves against external foes, they took into their pay John Hawkwood, an Englishman of great military reputation, who had long served the Pope and others in Italy. Their fears from without were increased by a report that several bodies of men were being assembled by Charles of Durazzo for the conquest of Naples, and many Florentine immigrants were said to have joined him. Against these dangers, in addition to the forces which had been raised, large sums of money were provided, and Charles, having arrived at Arezzo, obtained from the Florentines forty thousand ducats, and promised that he would not molest them. His enterprise was immediately prosecuted, and having occupied the kingdom of Naples, he sent Queen Giovanna a prisoner into Hungary. This victory renewed the fears of those who managed the affairs of Florence, for they could not persuade themselves that their money would have a greater influence on the king's mind than the friendship which his house had long retained for the Guelphs, whom they so grievously opposed. This suspicion thus increasing, multiplied oppressions, which, again, instead of diminishing the suspicion, augmented it, so that most men lived in the utmost discontent. To this the insolence of Giorgio Scali and Tommaso Strozzi, who by their popular influence overawed the magistrates, also contributed, for the rulers were apprehensive that, by the power these men possessed with the plebeians, they could set them at defiance. And hence it is evident that, not only to good men, but even to the seditious, this government appeared tyrannical and violent. To put a period to the outrageous conduct of Giorgio, it happened that a servant of his accused Giovanni di Cambio of practices against the state, but the Capitano declared him innocent. Upon this the judge determined to punish the accuser with the same penalties that the accused would have incurred had he been guilty, but Giorgio Scali, 
unable to save him either by his authority or entreaties, obtained the assistance of Tommaso Strozzi, and with a multitude of armed men, set the informer at liberty and plundered the palace of the Capitano, who was obliged to save himself by flight. This act excited such great and universal animosity against him, that his enemies began to hope they would be able to effect his ruin, and also to rescue the city from the power of the plebeians, who for three years had held her under their arrogant control. To the realization of this design the Capitano greatly contributed, for the tumult having subsided, he presented himself before the seniors, and said, he had cheerfully undertaken the office to which they had appointed him, for he thought he should serve upright men who would take arms for the defence of justice, and not impede its progress. But now that he had seen and had experience of the proceedings of the city, and the manner in which affairs were conducted, that dignity which he had voluntarily assumed with the hope of acquiring honour and emolument, he now more willingly resigned, to escape from the losses and danger to which he found himself exposed. The complaint of the Capitano was heard with the utmost attention by the seniory, who promised to remunerate him for the injury he had suffered, and provide for his future security. He was satisfied. Some of them then obtained an interview with certain citizens who were thought to be lovers of the common good, and least suspected by the State, and in conjunction with these, it was concluded that the present was a favourable opportunity for rescuing the city from Giorgio and the plebeians the last outrage he had committed having completely alienated the great body of the people from him. They judged it best to profit by the occasion before the excitement had abated, for they knew that the favour of the mob is often gained or lost by the most trifling circumstance, and more certainly, to ensure success, they determined, if possible, to obtain the concurrence of Benedetto Alberti, for without it they considered their enterprise to be dangerous. Benedetto was one of the richest citizens, a man of unassuming manners, an ardent lover of the liberties of his country, and one to whom tyrannical measures were in the highest degree offensive, so that he was easily induced to concur in their views and consent to Giorgio's ruin. His enmity against the nobles of the people and the Guelphs, and his friendship for the plebeians, were caused by the insolence and tyrannical proceedings of the former, but finding that the plebeians had soon become quite as insolent, he quickly separated himself from them, and the injuries committed by them against the citizens were done wholly without his consent. So that the same motives which made him join the plebeians induced him to leave them. Having gained Benedetto and the leaders of the trades to their side, they provided themselves with arms and made Giorgio prisoner. Tommaso fled. The next day Giorgio was beheaded, which struck so great a terror into his party that none ventured to express the slightest disapprobation but each seemed anxious to be foremost in defence of the measure. On being led to execution, in the presence of that people who only a short time before had idolised him, Giorgio complained of his hard fortune, and the malignity of those citizens who, having done him an undeserved injury, had compelled him to honour and support a mob, possessing neither faith nor gratitude. Observing Benedetto Alberti among those who had armed themselves for the preservation of order, he said, do you, too, consent, Benedetto, that this injury shall be done to me? Were I in your place and you in mine, I would take care that no one should injure you. I tell you, however, this day is the end of my troubles and the beginning of yours. He then blamed himself for having confided too much in a people who may be excited and inflamed by every word, motion, and breath of suspicion. With these complaints he died in the midst of his armed enemies, delighted at his fall. Some of his most intimate associates were also put to death, and their bodies dragged about by the mob. End of Book 3, Chapter 5《Book 3, Chapter 6 of History of Florence》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1, by Niccolo Machiavelli. Translator Unknown. Book 3, Chapter 6. Confusion and Riots in the City. Reform of Government in Opposition to the Plebeians. Injuries Done to Those Who Favored the Plebeians. Michael de Lando Banished. Benedetto Alberti Hated by the Signory. Fears Excited by the Coming of Louis of Anjou. The Florentines Purchase Arezzo. Benedetto Alberti becomes suspected and is banished. His discourse upon leaving the city. Other citizens banished and admonished. 
war with Giovanni Galeazzo, Duke of Milan. The death of Giorgio caused very great excitement. Many took arms at the execution in favor of the signory and the capitano, and many others, either for ambition or as a means for their own safety, did the same. The city was full of conflicting parties, who each had a particular end in view, and wished to carry it into effect before they disarmed. The ancient nobility, called the Great, could not bear to be deprived of public honors, for the recovery of which they used their utmost exertions, and earnestly desired that authority might be restored to the Capitani di Parte. The nobles of the people and the major trades were discontented at the share the minor trades and lowest of the people possessed in the government, while the minor trades were desirous of increasing their influence, and the lowest people were apprehensive of losing the companies of their trades, and the authority which these conferred. Such opposing views occasioned Florence, during a year, to be disturbed by many riots. Sometimes the nobles of the people took arms, sometimes the major and sometimes the minor trades and lowest of the people, and it often happened that, though in different parts, all were at once in insurrection. Hence many conflicts took place between the different parties, or with the forces of the palace, for the seigneury sometimes yielding, and at other times resisting, adopted such remedies as they could for these numerous evils. At length, after two assemblies of the people, and many balias appointed for the reformation of the city, after much toil, labor, and eminent danger, a government was appointed, by which all who had been banished since Silvestro de Medici was gonfalonier were restored. They who had acquired distinctions or emoluments by the balia of 1378 were deprived of them. The honors of government were restored to the Guelphic party, the two new companies of the trades were dissolved, and all who had been subject to them assigned to their former companies. The minor trades were not allowed to elect the gonfalonier of justice, their share of honors was reduced from half to a third, and those of the highest rank were withdrawn from them altogether. Thus the nobles of the people and the Guelphs repossessed themselves of the government, which was lost by the plebeians after it had been in their possession from 1378 to 1381, when these changes took place. The new establishment was not less injurious to the citizens, or less troublesome at its commencement, than that of the plebeians had been, for many of the nobles of the people, who had distinguished themselves as leaders of the plebeians, were banished, with a great number of the leaders of the latter, among whom was Michael de Lando, nor could all the benefits conferred upon the city by his authority, when in danger from the lawless mob, save him from the rabid fury of the party that was now in power. His good offices evidently excited little gratitude in his countrymen. The neglect of their benefactors is an error into which princes and republics frequently fall, and hence mankind, alarmed by such examples, as soon as they begin to perceive the ingratitude of their rulers, set themselves against them. As these banishments and executions had always been offensive to Benedetto Alberti, they continue to disgust him, and he censured them both publicly and privately. The leaders of the government began to fear him, for they considered him one of the most earnest friends of the plebeians, and thought he had not consented to the death of Giorgio Scali from disapprobation of his proceeding, but that he might be left himself without a rival in the government. His discourse and his conduct alike served to increase their suspicions, so that all the ruling party had their eyes upon him, and eagerly sought an opportunity of crushing him. During this state of things, external affairs were not of serious importance, for some which ensued were productive of apprehension rather than of injury. At this time, Louis of Anjou came into Italy to recover the kingdom of Naples for Queen Giovanna and drive out Charles of Durazzo. His coming terrified the Florentines, for Charles, according to the custom of old friends, demanded their assistance, and Louis, like those who seek new alliances, required their neutrality. The Florentines, that they might seem to comply with the request of Louis, and at the same time assist Charles, discharged from their service Sir John Hawkwood, and transferred him to that of Pope Urban, who was friendly to Charles. But this deceit was at once detected, and Louis considered himself greatly injured by the Florentines. While the war was carried on between Louis and Charles in Puglia, new forces were sent from France in aid of Louis, and on arriving in Tuscany were, by the emigrants of Arezzo, conducted to that city, and took it from those who held possession for Charles. And, when they were about to change the government of Florence, as they had already done that of Arezzo, Louis died, and the order of things in Puglia and in Tuscany was changed accordingly, 
for Charles secured the kingdom, which had been all but lost, and the Florentines, who were apprehensive for their own city, purchased Arezzo from those who held it for Louis. Charles, having secured Puglia, went to take possession of Hungary, to which he was heir, leaving with his wife, his children, Ladislaus and Giovanna, who were yet infants. He took possession of Hungary, but was soon after slain there. As great rejoicings were made in Florence on account of this acquisition as ever took place in any city for a real victory, which served to exhibit the public and private wealth of the people, many families endeavouring to vie with the state itself in displays of magnificence. The Alberti surpassed all others. The tournaments and exhibitions made by them were rather suitable for a sovereign prince than for any private individuals. These things increased the envy with which the family was regarded, and being joined with suspicions which the state entertained of Benedetto, were the causes of his ruin. The rulers could not endure him, for it appeared as if, at any moment, something might occur, which, with the favour of his friends, would enable him to recover his authority, and drive them out of the city. While in this state of suspicion and jealousy, it happened that while he was gonfalonier of the companies, his son-in-law, Filippo Magliati, was drawn gonfalonier of justice, and this circumstance increased the fears of the government, for they thought it would strengthen Benedetto's influence, and place the state in the greater peril. Anxious to provide a remedy, without creating much disturbance, they induced Beze Magalati, his relative and enemy, to signify to the signory that Filippo, not having attained the age required for the exercise of that office, neither could nor ought to hold it. The question was examined by the seniors, and part of them, out of hatred, others in order to avoid disunion among themselves, declared Filippo ineligible to the dignity, and in his stead was drawn Bardo Mancini, who was quite opposed to the plebeian interests, and an inveterate foe of Benedetto. This man, having entered upon the duties of his office, created a balia for the reformation of the state, which banished Benedetto Alberti and admonished all the rest of his family except Antonio. Before his departure, Benedetto called them together, and observing their melancholy demeanour, said, You see, my fathers, and you the elders of our house, how fortune has ruined me and threatened you. I am not surprised at this, neither ought you to be so, for it always happens thus to those who, among a multitude of the wicked, wish to act rightly, and endeavour to sustain what the many seek to destroy. The love of my country made me take part with Silvestro de' Medici, and afterwards separated me from Giorgio Scali. The same cause compelled me to detest those who now govern, who, having none to punish them, will allow no one to reprove their misdeeds. I am content that my banishment should deliver from them the fears they entertain, not of me only, but of all who they think perceives or is acquainted with their tyrannical and wicked proceedings, and they have aimed their first blow at me, in order the more easily to oppress you. I do not grieve on my own account, for those honours which my country bestowed on me while free, she cannot in her slavery take from me, and the recollection of my past life will always give me greater pleasure than the pain imparted by the sorrows of exile. I deeply regret that my country is left a prey to the greediness and pride of the few who keep her in subjugation. I grieve for you, for I fear that the evils which this day cease to affect me, and commence with you, will pursue you with even greater malevolence than they have me. Comfort, then, each other, resolve to bear up against every misfortune, and conduct yourselves in such a manner, that when disasters befall you, and there will be many, every one may know that they have come upon you undeservedly. Not to give a worse impression of his virtue abroad than he had done at home, he made a journey to the sepulchre of Christ, and while upon his return died at Rhodes. His remains were brought to Florence, and interred with all possible honours, by those who had persecuted him, when alive, with every species of calumny and injustice. The family of the Alberti was not the only injured party during these troubles of the city, for many others were banished and admonished. Of the former were Piero Benetti, Matteo Alderati, Giovanni and Francesco del Bene, Giovanni Benci, Andrea Adamari, and with them many members of the minor trades. Of the admonished were the Covini, Benini, Renucci, Formiconi, Corbisi, Manelli, and Alderati. It was customary to create the balia for a limited time, and when the citizens elected had effected the purpose of their appointment, they resigned from the office from motives of good feeling and decency, 
although the time allowed might not have expired. In conformity with this laudable practice, the Balia of that period, supposing they had accomplished all that was expected of them, wished to retire, but when the multitude were acquainted with their intention, they ran armed to the palace, and insisted that before resigning their power many other persons should be banished and admonished. This greatly displeased the seniors, but without disclosing the extent of their displeasure, they contrived to amuse the multitude with promises, till they had assembled a sufficient body of armed men, and then took such measures that fear induced the people to lay aside the weapons which madness had led them to take up. Nevertheless, in some degree to gratify the fury of the mob, and to reduce the authority of the plebeian trades, it was provided that as the latter had previously possessed a third of the honours, they should in future have only a fourth. That there might always be two of the seniors particularly devoted to the government, they gave authority to the gonfalonier of justice, and four others, to form a ballot purse of select citizens, from which, in every seniory, two should be drawn. This government, from its establishment in 1381, till the alterations now made, had continued six years, and the internal peace of the city remained undisturbed until 1393. During this time, Giovanni Galeazzo Visconti, usually called the Count of Virtu, imprisoned his uncle Barnabo, and thus became sovereign of the whole of Lombardy. As he had become Duke of Milan by fraud, he designed to make himself King of Italy by force. In 1391 he commenced a spirited attack upon the Florentines, but such various changes occurred in the course of the war that he was frequently in greater danger than the Florentines themselves, who, though they made a brave and admirable defence for a republic, must have been ruined if he had survived. As it was, the result was attended with infinitely less evil than their fears of so powerful an enemy had led them to apprehend, for the duke, having taken Bologna, Pisa, Perugia, and Siena, and prepared a diadem with which to be crowned king of Italy at Florence, died, before he had tasted the fruit of his victories, or the Florentines began to feel the effect of their disasters. End of Book 3, Chapter 6book 3 chapter 7 of history of florence this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a history of florence and of the affairs of italy volume 1 by niccolo machiavelli translator unknown book 3 chapter 7 maso degli albizzi his violence excites the anger of the people they have recourse to Veri de' Medici, the modesty of Veri. He refuses to assume the dignity of prince, and appeases the people. Discourse of Veri to the seniory. The banished Florentines endeavour to return. They secretly enter the city and raise a tumult. Some of them slain, others taken to the church of St. Reparata. A conspiracy of exiles supported by the Duke of Milan. The conspiracy discovered, and the parties punished. Various Enterprises of the Florentines, Taking of Pisa, War with the King of Naples, Acquisition of Cortona. During the war with the Duke of Milan, the office of Gonfalonier of Justice fell to Maso degli Albizzi, who by the death of Piero in 1379 had become the inveterate enemy of the Alberti, and as party feeling is incapable either of repose or abatement, he determined, notwithstanding Benedetto had died in exile, that before the expiration of his majesty he would revenge himself on the remainder of that family. He seized the opportunity afforded by a person, who on being examined respecting correspondence maintained with the rebels, accused Andrea and Alberto degli Alberti of such practices. They were immediately arrested, which so greatly excited the people, that the seniory, having provided themselves with an armed force, called the citizens to a general assembly or parliament, and appointed a balia, by whose authority many were banished, and a new ballot for the offices of the government was made. Among the banished were nearly all the Alberti, many members of the trades were admonished, and some put to death. Stung by these numerous injuries, the trades and the lowest of the people rose in arms, considering themselves despoiled both of honour and life. One body of them assembled in the piazza, another ran to the house of Vero de' Medici, who, after the death of Salvestro, was head of the family. The scenery, in order to appease those who came to the piazza or court of the palace, gave them for leaders, with the ensigns of the Guelphs and of the people in their hands, Rinaldo Gianfigliazzi, 
and Donato Accia Gioli, both men of the popular class, and more attached to the interests of the plebeians than any other. Those who went to the house of Veri de' Medici begged that he would be pleased to undertake the government, and free them from the tyranny of those citizens who were destroying the peace and safety of the commonwealth. It is agreed by all who have written concerning the events of this period, that if Veri had had more ambition than integrity, he might without any impediment have become prince of the city, for the unfeeling treatment which, whether right or wrong, had been inflicted upon the trades and their friends, had so excited the minds of men to vengeance, that all they required was some one to be their leader. Nor were there wanting those who could inform him of the state of public feeling, for Antonio de' Medici, with whom he had for some time been upon terms of most intimate friendship, endeavoured to persuade him to undertake the government of the Republic. To this Veri replied, Thy menaces, when thou wert my enemy, never alarmed me, nor shall thy counsel, now when thou art my friend, do me any harm. Then, turning toward the multitude, he bade them be of good cheer, for he would be their defender, if they would allow themselves to be advised by him. He then went, accompanied by a great number of citizens, to the piazza, and addressed directly to the audience-chamber of the signory, whom he addressed to this effect, that he could not regret having lived so as to gain the love of the Florentines, but he was sorry they had formed an opinion of him which his past life had not warranted, for never having done anything that could be construed as either factious or ambitious, he could not imagine how it had happened, that they should think him willing to stir up strife as a discontented person, or usurp the government of his country like an ambitious one. He therefore begged that the infatuation of the multitude might not injure him in their estimation, for to the utmost of his power their authority should be restored. He then recommended them to use good fortune with moderation, for it would be much better to enjoy an imperfect victory with safety to the city than a complete one at her ruin. The signory applauded Veri's conduct, begged he would endeavour to prevent recourse to arms, and promised that what he and the other citizens might deem most advisable should be done. Veri then returned to the piazza, where the people who had followed him were joined by those led by Donato and Rinaldo, and informed the united companies that he had found the signory most kindly disposed toward them, that many things had been taken into consideration, which the shortness of time and the absence of the magistrates rendered incapable of being finished. He therefore begged that they would lay down their arms and obey the signory, assuring them that humility would prevail rather than pride, entreaties rather than threats, and if they would take his advice, their privileges and security would remain unimpaired. He thus induced them to return peaceably to their homes. The disturbance having subsided, the signory armed the piazza, enrolled two thousand of the most trusty citizens, who were divided equally by gonfalons, in order to be in readiness to give their assistance whenever required, and they forbade the use of arms to all who were not thus enrolled. Having adopted these precautionary measures, they banished and put to death many of those members of the trades who had shown the greatest audacity in the late riots, and to invest the office of gonfalonier of justice with more authoritative majesty, they ordered that no one should be eligible to it, under forty-five years of age. Many other provisions for the defence of the state were made, which appeared intolerable to those against whom they were directed, and were odious even to the friends of the signory themselves, for they could not believe a government to be either good or secure, which needed so much violence for its defence, a violence excessively offensive, not only to those of the Alberti who remained in the city, and to the Medici, who felt themselves injured by these proceedings, but also to many others. The first who attempted resistance was Donato, the son of Jacopo Acquagioli, who thought of great authority, and the superior, rather than the equal, of Maso degli Albizzi, who, on account of the events which took place while he was gonfalonier of justice, was almost at the head of the Republic, could not enjoy repose amid such general discontent, or, like many others, convert social evils to his own private advantage, and therefore resolved to attempt the restoration of the exiles to their country, or at least their offices to the admonished. He went from one to another, disseminating his views, showing that the people would not be satisfied, or the ferment of parties subside, without the changes he proposed, and declared that if he were in the seigneury, he would soon carry them into effect. In human affairs, delay causes tedium, and haste danger. To avoid what was tedious, Donato Acquagioli resolved to attempt what involved danger. Michel Acquagioli, his relative, and Niccolò Ricoveri, his friend, were of the seigneury. 
This seemed to Donato a conjuncture of circumstances too favourable to be lost, and he requested they would propose a law to the councils, which would include the restoration of the citizens. They, at his entreaty, spoke about the matter to their associates, who replied that it was improper to attempt any innovation in which the advantage was doubtful and the danger certain. Upon this, Donato, having in vain tried all other means he could think of, excited with anger, gave them to understand that since they would not allow the city to be governed with peaceful measures, he would try what could be done with arms. These words gave so great offence, that being communicated to the heads of the government, Donato was summoned, and having appeared, the truth was proven by those to whom he had entrusted the message, and he was banished to Barletta. Alamano and Antonio de' Medici were also banished, and all those of that family, who were descended from Alamano, with many who, though of the inferior artificers, possessed influence with the plebeians. These events took place two years after the reform of government effected by Maso degli Albizzi. At this time many discontented citizens were at home, and others banished in the adjoining states. Of the latter there lived at Bologna Piccio Cavicciuli, Tommaso de Ricci, Antonio de' Medici, Benedetto degli Spini, Antonio Girolami, Cristofano de Coloni, and two others of the lowest order, all bold young men, and resolved upon returning to their country at any hazard. These were secretly told by Pigelio and Borroccio Cavicciuli, who, being admonished, lived in Florence, that if they came to this city they should be concealed in their house, from which they might afterward issue, slay Maso degli Albizzi, and call the people to arms, who, full of discontent, would willingly arise, particularly as they would be supported by the Ricci, Adamari, Medici, Manelli, and many other families. Excited with these hopes, on the 4th of August, 1397, they came to Florence, and having entered unobserved according to their arrangement, they sent one of their party to watch Maso, designing with his death to raise the people. Maso was observed to leave his house and proceed to that of an apothecary, near the church of San Pietro Maggiore, which he entered. The man who went to watch him ran to give information to the other conspirators, who took their arms and hastened to the house of the apothecary, but found that Maso had gone. However, undaunted with the failure of their first attempt, they proceeded to the old market, where they slew one of the adverse party, and with loud cries of people, arms, liberty, and death to the tyrants, directed their course toward the new market, and at the end of the Kalimala slew another. Pursuing their course with the same cries, and finding no one joined them in arms, they stopped at the Loggio Nigatosa, where, from an elevated situation, being surrounded with a great multitude, assembled to look on rather than assist them, they exhorted the men to take arms and deliver themselves from the slavery which weighed so heavily upon them, declaring that the complaints of the discontented in the city, rather than their own grievances, had induced them to attempt their deliverance. They had heard that many prayed to God for an opportunity of avenging themselves, and vowed they would use it whenever they found any one to conduct them. But now, when the favourable circumstances occurred, and they found those who were ready to lead them, they stared at each other like men stupefied, and would wait till those who were endeavouring to recover for them their liberty were slain, and their own chains more strongly riveted upon them. They wondered that those who were wont to take arms upon slight occasions remain unmoved under the pressure of so many and so great evils, and that they could willingly suffer such numbers of their fellow-citizens to be banished, so many admonished, when it was in their power to restore the banished to their country, and the admonished to the honours of the state. These words, although full of truth, produced no effect upon those to whom they were addressed, for they were either restrained by their fears, or, on account of the two murders which had been committed, disgusted with the parties. Thus the movers of the tumult, finding that neither words or deeds had force sufficient to stir any one, saw, when too late, how dangerous a thing it is to attempt to set a people free who are resolved to be slaves, and, despairing of success, they withdrew to the temple of Santa Raparata, where, not to save their lives, but to defer the moment of their death, they shut themselves up. Upon the first rumour of the affair, the scenery, being in fear, armed and secured the palace, but when the facts of the case were understood, the parties known, and whither they had betaken themselves, their fears subsided, and they sent the capitano with a sufficient body of armed men to secure them. The gates of the temple were forced without much trouble, part of the conspirators were slain defending themselves, the remainder were made prisoners and examined, 
but none were found implicated in the affair except Baraccio and Pigelio Caviciuli, who were put to death with them. Shortly after this event, another occurred of greater importance. The Florentines were, as we have before remarked, at war with the Duke of Milan, who, finding that with merely an open force he could not overcome them, had recourse to secret practices, and with the assistance of the exiles of whom Lombardy was full, he formed a plot to which many in the city were accessory. It was resolved by the conspirators that most of the emigrants, capable of bearing arms, should set out from the places nearest Florence, enter the city by the river Arno, and with their friends hasten to the residence of the chiefs of the government, and having slain them, reform the republic according to their own will. Of the conspirators within the city, one was of the Ricci, named Saminiato, and, as it often happens in treacherous practices, few are insufficient to effect the purpose of the plot, and among many secrecy cannot be preserved, so while Saminiato was in quest of associates, he found an accuser. He confided the affair to Salvestro Caviciuli, whose wrongs and those of his friends were thought sufficient to make him faithful. But he, more influenced by immediate fear than the hope of future vengeance, discovered the whole affair to the signory, who, having caused Saminiato to be taken, compelled him to tell all the particulars of the matter. However, None of the conspirators were taken, except Tommaso da Vizzi, who, coming from Bologna, and unaware of what had occurred at Florence, was seized immediately upon his arrival. All the others had fled immediately upon the apprehension of Saminiato. Saminiato and Tommaso, having been punished according to their deserts, a balia was formed of many citizens, which sought the delinquents, and took measures for the security of the state. They declared six of the family of the Ricci rebels— also six of the Alberti, two of the Medici, three of the Scali, two of the Strozzi, Bindo Altoviti, Bernardo Adamari, and many others of inferior quality. They admonished all the family of the Alberti, the Ricci, and the Medici for ten years, except a few individuals. Among the Alberti, not admonished, was Antonio, who was thought to be quiet and peaceable. It happened, however, before all suspicion of the conspiracy had ceased, a monk was taken who had been observed during its progress to pass frequently between Bologna and Florence. He confessed that he had often carried letters to Antonio, who was immediately seized, and though he denied all knowledge of the matter from the first, the monk's accusation prevailed, and he was fined in a considerable sum of money, and banished a distance of three hundred miles from Florence. That the Alberti might not constantly place the city in jeopardy, every member of the family was banished whose age exceeded fifteen years. These events took place in the year 1400, and two years afterward died Giovanni Galeazzo, Duke of Milan, whose death, as we have said above, put an end to the war, which had then continued twelve years. At this time, the government having gained greater strength, and being without enemies, external or internal, undertook the conquest of Pisa, and having gloriously completed it, the peace of the city remained undisturbed from 1400 to 1433, except that in 1412, the Alberti, having crossed the boundary they were forbidden to pass, a balia was formed which with new provisions fortified the state and punished the offenders with heavy fines. During this period also, the Florentines made war with Ladislaus, king of Naples, who finding himself in great danger ceded to them the city of Cortona, of which he was master. But soon afterward, recovering his power, he renewed the war, which became far more disastrous to the Florentines than before, and had it not, in 1414, been terminated by his death, as that of Lombardy had been by the death of the Duke of Milan, he, like the Duke, would have brought Florence into great danger of losing her liberty. Nor was the war with the king concluded with less good fortune than the former, for when he had taken Rome, Siena, the whole of La Marca and Romagna, and had only Florence itself to vanquish, he died. Thus death has always been more favourable to the Florentines than any other friend, and more potent to save them than their own valour. From the time of the king's decease, peace was preserved both at home and abroad for eight years, at the end of which, with the wars of Filippo, Duke of Milan, the spirit of faction again broke out, and was only appeased by the ruin of that government which continued from 1381 to 1434, had conducted with great glory so many enterprises, acquired Arezzo, Pisa, Cortona, Leghorn, and Montepulciano, and would have accomplished more if the citizens had lived in unity, and had not revived former factions, 
as in the following book will be particularly shown. End of Book 3, Chapter 7「Book Four, Chapter One of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniele. History of Florence and the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolò Machiavelli. Translator unknown. Book Four, Chapter One. License and slavery, peculiar defects in republican governments. Application of this reflection to the state of Florence. Giovanni di Bici di Medici re-establishes the authority of his family. Filippo Visconti, Duke of Milan, endeavors to make amicable arrangements with the Florentines. Their jealousy of him precautionary measures against him war declared the florentines are routed by the ducal forces republican governments more especially those imperfectly organized frequently change their rulers and the form of their institutions not by the influence of liberty and subjection as many suppose but by that of slavery and license for with the nobility or the people, the ministers, respectively of slavery or licentiousness, only the name of liberty is in any estimations, neither of them choosing to be subject either to magistrates or laws. When, however, a good, wise and powerful citizen appears, which is but seldom, who establishes ordinances capable of appeasing or restraining these contending dispositions, so as to prevent them from doing mischief, then the government may be called free, and its institutions firm and secure. For having good laws for its basis, and good regulations for carrying them into effect, it needs not, like others, the virtue of one man for its maintenance. With such excellent laws and institutions, many of those ancient republics which were of long durations were endowed. But these advantages are, and always have been, denied to those which frequently change from tyranny to license, or the reverse, because, from the powerful enemies which each condition creates itself, they neither have, nor can possess, any stability. For tyranny cannot please the good, and license is offensive to the wise, the former may easily be productive of mischief, while the latter can scarcely be beneficial. In the former the insolent have too much authority, and in the latter the foolish, so that each requires for their welfare the virtue of the good fortune of some individual who may be removed by death or become unserviceable by misfortune. Hence, it appears, that the government which commenced in Florence at the death of Giorgio Scali in 1381 was first sustained by the talents of Maso degli Abizzi and then by those of Niccolò d'Auzzano. The city remained tranquil from 1414 to 1422, for the king Ladislaus was dead and Lombardy divided into several parts, so that there was nothing either internal or external to occasion uneasiness. Next to Niccolò d'Auzzano in authority were Bartolomeo Valori, Neuroni di Nigi, Rinaldo degli Abizzi, Neri di Gino, and Lapo Niccolini. The faction that arose from the quarrels of the Albizzi and the Ricci, and which were afterwards so unhappily revived by Salvestro de' Medici, were never extinguished for though the party most favored the rebel only continued three years and in 1381 was put down still as it comprehended the greatest numerical proportion it was never entirely extinct though the frequent barriers and persecutions of its leaders from 1381 to 1400 reduced it almost to nothing the first families that suffered in this way 
were the Alberti, the Ricci, and the Medici, which were frequently deprived both of men and money. And if any of them remained in the city, they were deprived of the honors of government. These oft-repeated acts of oppression humiliated the faction and almost annihilated it. Still, many retained the remembrance of the injuries they had received, and the desire of vengeance remained pent in their bosoms, ungratified and unquenched. Those nobles of the people, or new nobility, who peaceably governed the city, committed two errors, which eventually caused the ruin of their party. The first was that by long continuance in power they became insolent, the second, that the envy they entertained toward each other and their uninterrupted possession of power destroyed the vigilance over those who might injure them, which they ought to have exercised. Thus daily renewing the hatred of a mass of the people by their sinister proceedings and either negligent of the threatened dangers, because rendered fearless by prosperity or encouraging them through mutual envy they gave an opportunity to the family of the medici to recover their influence the first to do so was giovanni de bici de medici who having become one of the richest men and being of a human and benevolent disposition obtained the supreme magistracy by the consent of those in power this circumstance gave so much gratification to the mass of the people, the multitude thinking they had now found a defender, that not without occasion the judicious of the party observed it with jealousy, for they perceived all the former feelings of the city revived. Niccolò d'Ausano need not fail to acquaint the other citizens with the matter, explaining to them how dangerous it was to aggrandize one who possessed so much influence that it was easy to remedy an evil at its commencement but exceedingly difficult after having allowed it to gather strength and that giovanni possessed several qualities far surpassing those of salvestro the associates of niccolo were uninfluenced by his remarks for they were jealous of his reputation and desired to exalt some person by means of whom he might be humbled this was the state of florence in which opposing feelings began to be observable when filippo visconti second son of giovanni galeazzo having by the death of his brother become master of all lombardy and thinking he might undertake almost anything greatly desired to recover genoa which enjoyed freedom under the dojoate of Tommaso da Campo Fregoso. He did not think it advisable to attempt this or any other enterprise till he had renewed amicable relations with the Florentines and made his good understanding with them known. But with the aid of their reputation, he trusted he should attain his wishes. He, therefore, sent ambassadors to Florence to signify his desires. Many citizens were opposed to his design, but did not wish to interrupt the peace with Milan, which had now continued for many years. They were fully aware of the advantages it would derive from a war with Genoa, and the little use it would be to Florence. Many others were inclined to accede to it, but would set a limit to his proceedings which, if he were to exceed, all would perceive his base design, and thus they might, when the treaty was broken, more justifiable make war against him. The question having been strongly debated, an amicable arrangement was at length effected, by which Filippo engaged not to interfere with anything on the Florentine side of the rivers Magra and Panaro. Soon after the treaty was concluded, the duke took possession of Brescia, and shortly afterward of Genoa, contrary to the expectation of those who had advocated peace, for they thought Brescia would be defended by the Venetians, and Genoa would be able to defend herself. And, as in the treaty which Filippo made with the Doge of Genoa, 
he had acquired Serezana and other places situated on the side of the Magra, upon condition that, if he wished to alienate them, they should be given to the Genoese. It was quite palpable that he had broken the treaty, and he had, besides, entered into another treaty with the legate of Bologna, in opposition to his engagement respecting the Panaro. These things disturbed the minds of the citizens, and made them, apprehensive of new troubles, consider the means to be adopted for their defence. The dissatisfaction of the Florentines coming to the knowledge of Filippo, he, either to justify himself, or to become acquainted with their prevailing feelings, or to lull them to repose, sent ambassadors to the city, to intimate that he was greatly surprised at the suspicions they entertained, and offered to revoke whatever he had done that could be thought as a ground of jealousy. This embassy produced no other effect than that of dividing the citizens. One party, that in greatest reputation, judged it best to arm and prepare to frustrate the enemy's designs, and, if he were to remain quiet, it would not be necessary to go to war with him, but an endeavour might be made to preserve peace. Many others, whether envious of those in power, or fearing a rapture with the duke, considered it unadvisable so lightly to entertain suspicions of an ally, and thought his proceedings need not have excited so much distrust that appointing to ten and hiring forces was in itself a manifest declaration of war, which, if undertaken against so great a prince, would bring certain ruin upon the city without the hope of any advantage. For possession could never be retained of the conquests that might be made, because Romagna lay between, and the vicinity of the church ought to prevent any attempt against Romagna itself. However, the views of those who were in favour of a wall prevailed. The council of them were appointed, forces were hired, and new taxes levied, which, as they were more burdensome upon the lower than the upper ranks, filled the city with complaints, and all condemned the ambition and avarice of the great, declaring that, to gratify themselves and oppress the people, they would go to war without any justifiable motive. They had not yet come to an open rupture with the duke, but everything tended to excite suspicion. For Filippo had, at the request of the legate of Bologna, who was in fear of Antonio Bentivogli, an emigrant of Bologna at Castel Bolognese, sent forces to that city, which, being closed upon the Florentine territory, filled the citizens with apprehension. But what gave everyone greater alarm, and offered sufficient occasion for the declaration of war, was the expedition made by the duke against Furli. Giorgio Laffi was lord of Furli, who, dying, left Tibaldo, his son, under the guardianship of Filippo. The boy's mother, Suspicious of his guardian, sent him to Lodovico Alidossi, her father, who was lord of Imola, but she was compelled by the people of Furli to obey the will of her deceased husband, to withdraw him from the natural guardian and place him in the hands of the duke. Upon this, Filippo, the better to conceal his purpose, caused the Marquis of Ferrara to send Guido Tortello as his agent, with forces to seize the government of Furli, and thus the territory fell into the duke's hands. When this was known at Florence, together with the arrival of forces at Bologna, the arguments in favour of war were greatly strengthened, but there were still many opposed to it and among the rest Giovanni de' Medici, who publicly endeavoured to show that even if the ill designs of the duke were perfectly manifest, it would still be better to wait and let him commence the attack than to assail him. 
for in the former case they would be justified in the view of the princes of Italy as well as in their own. But if they were to strike the first blow at the duke, public opinion would be as favourable to him as to themselves, and besides they could not so confidently demand assistance as assailants as they might do if assailed and that men always defend themselves more vigorously when they attack others. The advocates of war considered it improper to await the enemy in their houses, and better to go and seek him, that fortune is always more favourable to assailants than to such as merely act on the defensive, and that it is less injurious even when attended with greater immediate expense to make war at another's door than at our own. These views prevailed, and it was resolved that the ten should provide all the means in their power for rescuing Furli from the hands of the duke. Filippo, finding the Florentines resolved to occupy the places he had undertaken to defend, postponed all personal considerations, and sent Agnolo della Pergola with a strong force against Imola, that Ludovico, having to provide for defense of his own possessions, might be unable to protect the interests of his grandson. Agnolo approached Imola while the forces of the Florentines were at Modigliana, and an intense frost having rendered the ditches of the city passable, he crossed them during the night, captured the place, and sent Lodovico a prisoner to Milan. The Florentines, finding Imola in the hands of the enemy, and the war publicly known, sent their forces to Furli, and besieged it on all sides. That the duke's people might not relieve it, they hired Count Alberigo, who from Zagonara, his own domain, overran the country daily up to the gates of Imola. Agnolo della Pergola, finding the strong position which the Florentines had taken prevented him from relieving Furli, determined to attempt the capture of Zagonara, thinking they would not allow the place to be lost and that, in the endeavour to relieve it, they would be compelled to give up their design against Furli, and come to an engagement under great disadvantage. Thus, the duke's people compelled Alberigo to sue for terms, which he obtained on condition of giving up Zagonara, if the Florentines did not relieve him in fifteen days. This misfortune being known in the Florentine camp, and in the city, and all being anxious that the enemy should not obtain the expected advantage, they enabled him to secure a greater, for having abandoned the siege of Furli to go to the reef of Zagonara, on encountering the enemy they were soon routed, not so much by the bravery of their adversaries as by the severity of the season, for having marched many hours through deep mud and heavy rain, they found the enemy quite fresh, and were therefore easily vanquished. Nevertheless, in this great defeat, famous throughout all Italy, no death occurred except those of Lodovico degli Abizzi and two of his people, who, having fallen from their horses, were drowned in the morass. End of Book 4, Chapter 1 Recording by Daniele November 2008book 4 chapter 2 of history of florence this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by daniele history of florence and the affairs of italy volume 1 by niccolo machiavelli translator unknown Book 4, Chapter 2 The Florentines murmur against those who had been advocates of the war. Rinaldo degli Abizzi encourages the citizens. Measures for the prosecution of the war. 
attempt of the higher classes to deprive the plebeians of their share in the government. Rinaldo degli Albizzi addresses an assembly of citizens and advises the restoration of the Grandi. Nicola D'Auzzano wishes to have Giovanni de' Medici on their side. Giovanni disapproves of the advice of Rinaldo degli Albizzi. The defeat at Zagonara spread consternation through Florence, but none felt it so severely as the nobility who had been in favour of the war, for they perceived their enemies to be inspirited and themselves disarmed, without friends and opposed by the people, who at the corners of the street insulted them with the sarcastic expressions, complaining on the heavy taxes and the unnecessary war, and saying, Oh, they appointed the tent to frighten the enemy, have then relieved fully, and rescued her from the hands of the duke, no, but their designs have been discovered, and what had they in view? Not the defense of liberty, for they not love her, but to aggrandize their own power, which God has very justly abated. This is not the only enterprise by many a one with which they have oppressed the city, for the war against King Ladislaus was a similar kind. To whom will they flee for assistance now? To Pope Martin, whom they ridiculed before the face of Braccio, or to Queen Giovanna, whom they abandoned and compelled to throw herself under the protection of the King of Aragon. To these reproaches was added all that might be expected from an enraged multitude. Seeing the discontent so prevalent, the signory resolved to assemble a few citizens and with soft words endeavour to soothe the popular irritation. On this occasion Rinaldo degli Abizzi, the eldest son of Maso, who, by his own talents and the respect he derived from the memory of his father, aspired to the first offices in the government, and spoke at great length, showing that it is not right to judge of actions merely by their effects, for it often happens that what has been very maturely considered is attended with unfavorable results, that, if we are to applaud evil counsels because they are sometimes followed by fortunate events, we should only encourage men in error which would bring great mischief upon the Republic, because evil counsels is not always attended with happy consequences. In the same way, it would be wrong to blame a wise resolution, because of its being attended with an unfavorable issue, for by so doing we should destroy the inclination of citizens to offer advice and speak the truth. He then showed the property of undertaking the war, and that if it had not been commenced by the Florentines in Romagna, the duke would have assailed them in Tuscany. But since it had pleased God that the Florentine people should be overcome, their loss would be still greater if they allowed themselves to be dejected. But if they set a bold front against the adversity and made good use, of the means within their power, they would not be sensible of their loss or the duke of his victory. He assured them they ought not to be alarmed by impending expenses and consequent taxation, because the latter might be reduced and the future expense would not be so great as the former had been, for less preparation is necessary for those engaged in self-defense than for those who design to attack others. He advised them to imitate the conduct of their forefathers, who, by courageous conduct in adverse circumstances, had defended themselves against all their enemies. Thus encouraged, the citizens engaged Count Odo, the son of Braccio, and united with him, for directing the operation of the war. Niccolò Piccino, a pupil of his father's, and one of the most celebrated of all who had served under him. To these they added other leaders, and remounted some of those who had lost their horses in the late defeat. They also appointed twenty citizens to levy new taxes, 
who finding the great quiet subdued by recent loss, took courage and drained them without mercy. These burdens were very grievous to the nobility, who at first, in order to conciliate, did not complain of their own particular hardship, but censured the tax generally as unjust, and advised that something should be done in the way of relief. But their advice was rejected in the councils, therefore to render the law as offensive as possible, and to make all sensible of its injustice, they contrived that the taxes should be levied with the utmost rigour, and made it lawful to kill any that might resist the officers employed to collect them. Hence followed many lamentable collisions attended with the blood and death of the citizens. It began to be the impression of all that arms would be resorted to, and all prudent persons apprehended some approaching evil. For the higher ranks accustomed to be treated with respect could not endure to be used like dogs, and the rest were desirous that the taxation should be equalized. In consequence of this state of things, many of the first citizens met together, and it was resolved that it had become necessary for their safety that some attempt should be made to recover the government. Since their want of vigilance had encouraged men to censure public actions, and allowed those to interfere in affairs who had hitherto been merely the leaders of the rebel, Having repeatedly discussed the subject, they resolved to meet again at an appointed hour, when upwards of seventy citizens assembled in the church of St. Stephen, with the permission of Lorenzo Ridolfi and Francesco Gianfigliazzi, both members of the signory. Giovanni de' Medici was not among them, either because being under suspicion he was not invited, or that entertaining different views he was unwilling to interfere. Rinaldo degli Abizzi addressed the assembly, describing the condition of the city, and showing how by their own negligence it had again fallen under the power of the plebeians, from whom it had been wrested by their fathers in 1381. He reminded them of the iniquity of the government, which was in power from 1378 to 1381, and that all who were present had to lament, some a father, others a grandfather, put to death by its tyranny. He assured them they were now in the same danger, and that the city was sinking under the same disorders. The multitude had already imposed a tax of its own authority, and would soon, if not restrained by greater force or better regulations, appoint the magistrates who, in this case, would occupy their places and overturn the government which for forty-two years had ruled the city with so much glory. The citizens would then be subject to the will of the multitude and live disorderly and dangerous or be under the command of some individual who might make himself prince. For these reasons he was of opinion that whoever loved his country and his honour must arouse himself and call to mind the virtue of Bardo Mancini, who, by the ruin of the Alberti, rescued the city from the dangers then impending, and that the cause of the audacity now assumed by the multitude was the extensive squittini or pollings which by their negligence were allowed to be made. For thus the palace had become filled with the low man. He therefore concluded that the only means of remedying the evil was to restore the government to the nobility, and diminish the authority of the minor trades by reducing the companies from fourteen to seven, which would give to the plebeians less authority in the councils, both by the reduction in their number and by increasing the authority of the great, who, on account of former enmities, would be disinclined to favour them. He added that it is a good thing to know how to avail themselves of men according to the times, and that, as their fathers had used the plebeians to reduce the influence of the great, 
that now the great having been humbled and the plebeians become insolent it was well to restrain the insolence of the latter by the essence of the former to effect this they might proceed either openly or otherwise for some of them belonging to the council of ten forces might be led into the city without exciting observation rinaldo was much applauded and his advice was approved of by the whole assembly niccolo d'auzano who among others replied to it said all that rinaldo had advanced was correct and the remedies he proposed good and certain if they could be adopted without an absolute division of the city and this he had no doubt would be effected if they could induce giovanni de medici to join them for with him on their side the multitude being deprived of their chief and stay would be unable to oppose them but that if he did not concur with them they could do nothing without arms and that with them they would incur the risk of being vanquished or of not being able to reap the fruit of victory he then modestly reminded them of what he had said upon a former occasion and of their reluctance to remedy the evil when it might easily have been done that now the same remedy could not be attempted without incurring the danger of greater evils and therefore there was nothing left for them to do but to gain him over their side if practicable rinaldo was then commissioned to wait upon giovanni and try if he could induce him to join them he undertook this commission and in the most prevailing words he could make use of endeavoured to induce him to coincide with their views and begged that he would not be favouring an audacious mob enabled them to complete the ruin both of the government and the city to this giovanni replied that he considered it the duty of a good and wise citizen to avoid altering the institutions to which a city is accustomed there being nothing so injurious to the people as such a change for many are necessarily offended and where there are several discontented some unpropitious event might be constantly apprehended he said it appeared to him that their resolution would have two exceedingly pernicious effects the one conferring honours on those who having never possessed them esteemed them the less and therefore had the less occasion to grieve for their absence the other taking them from those who being accustomed to their possession would never be at rest till they were restored to them it would thus be evident that the injury done to one party was greater than the benefit they had conferred upon the other so that whoever was the author of the proposition he would gain few friends and make many enemies and that the latter would be more resolutely bent on injuring him that the former would be zealous for his defence for mankind are naturally more disposed to revenge than to gratitude as if the latter could only be exercised with some inconvenience to themselves while the former brings alike gratification and profit then directing his discourse more particularly to rinaldo he said and you if you could call to mind past events and knew how craftily affairs are conducted in this city would not be so eager in this pursuit for he who advises it when by your aid he was wrested the power from the people will with the people's assistance who will have become your enemies deprive you of it and it will happen to you as to benedetto alberti who at the persuasion of those who were not his friends consented to the ruin of giorgio scali and tommaso strozzi and shortly afterward was himself sent into exile by the very same man he therefore advised rinaldo to think more maturely of these things and endeavour to imitate his father who to obtain the benevolence of all reduced the price of the sword 
provided that whoever owed taxes under half a florin should be at liberty to pay them or not, as he thought proper, and that at the meeting of the councils everyone should be free from the importunities of his creditors. He concluded by saying that, as regarded himself, he was disposed to let the government of the city remain as it was. End of Book 4, Chapter 2 Recording by Daniele October 2008Book 4, Chapter 3 of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume 1, by Niccolò Machiavelli, Translator Unknown. Book 4, Chapter 3. Giovanni de' Medici acquires the favor of the people. Bravery of Biagio del Melano. Baseness of Zanobi d'Albino, the Florentines obtain the friendship of the Lord of Faenza, League of the Florentines with the Venetians, Origin of the Catasto, the rich citizens discontented with it, Peace with the Duke of Milan, New disturbances on account of the Catasto. These events, and the circumstances attending them, becoming known to the people, contributed greatly to increase the reputation of Giovanni, and brought odium on those who had made the proposals but he assumed an appearance of indifference in order to give less encouragement to those who by his influence were desirous of change. In his discourse he intimated to every one that it is not desirable to promote factions, but rather to extinguish them, and that whatever might be expected of him he only sought the union of the city. This, however, gave offence to many of his party, for they would have rather seen him exhibit greater activity. Among others so disposed was Alamanno de' Medici, who, being of a restless disposition, never ceased exciting him to persecute enemies and favor friends, condemning his coldness and slow method of proceeding, which he said was the cause of his enemies practicing against him, and that these practices would one day effect the ruin of himself and his friends. He endeavored to excite Cosmo, his son, with similar discourses. But Giovanni, for all that was either disclosed or foretold him, remained unmoved, although parties were now declared, and the city in manifest disunion. There were at the palace, in the service of the signory, two chancellors, Ser Martino and Ser Pagolo. The latter favored the party of Niccolo d'Auzzano, the former that of Giovanni, and Rinaldo, seeing Giovanni unwilling to join them, thought it would be advisable to deprive Ser Martino of his office, that he might have the palace more completely under his control. The design becoming known to his adversaries, Ser Martino was retained and Ser Pagolo discharged, to the great injury and displeasure of Rinaldo and his party. This circumstance would soon have produced most mischievous effects, but for the war with which the city was threatened, and the recent defeat suffered at Zagonaro, which served to check the audacity of the people. For while these events were in progress at Florence, Agnolo della Pergola, with the forces of the duke, had taken all the towns and cities possessed by the Florentines in Romagna, except Castracaro and Modigliano, partly from the weakness of the places themselves, and partly by the misconduct of those who had the command of them. In this course of the campaign, two instances occurred which served to show how greatly courage is admired even in enemies, and how much cowardice and pusillanimity are despised. Biagio del Melano was Castellan, in the fortress of Monte Petroso, being surrounded by enemies and seeing no chance of saving the place, which was already in flames, he cast clothes and straw from a part which was not yet on fire, and upon these he threw t his two little children, saying to the enemy, Take to yourselves those goods which fortune has bestowed upon me, and of which you may deprive me, but those of the mind in which my honor and glory consist I will not give up, neither can you wrest them from me. The besiegers ran to save the children, and placed for their father ropes and ladders by which to save himself, but he would not use them, and rather chose to die in the flames than owe his safety to the enemies of his country, an example worthy of that much lauded antiquity, which offers nothing to surpass it, and which we admire the more for the rarity of any similar occurrence. Whatever could be recovered from the ruins was restored for the use of the children, and carefully conveyed to their friends, nor was the Republic less grateful, for as long as they lived they were supported at her charge. An example of an opposite character occurred at Galietta, where Zanobi del Pino was governor. 
he without offering the least resistance gave up the fortress to the enemy and besides this advised agnolo della pergola to leave the alps of romagna and come among the smaller hills of tuscany where he might carry on the war with less danger and greater advantage agnolo could not endure the mean and base spirit of this man and delivered him to his own attendants who after many reproaches gave him nothing to eat but paper painted with snakes saying that of a guelph they would make him a ghibelline and thus fasting he died in a few days at this time count odo and niccolo piccinino entered the val di la mona with the design of bringing the lord of faenza over to the florentines or at least inducing him to restrain the incursions of agnolo di pergola in romagna but this valley is naturally strong and its inhabitants warlike count odo was slain there and niccolo piccinino sent a prisoner to faenza fortune however caused the florentines to obtain by their loss what perhaps they would have failed to acquire by victory for niccolo so prevailed with the lord of faenza and his mother that they became friends of the florentines by this treaty niccolo piccinino was set at liberty but did not take the advice he had given others for while in treaty with the city concerning the terms of his engagement either the conditions proposed were insufficient or he found better elsewhere for quite suddenly he left arezzo where he had been staying passed into lombardy and entered the service of the duke the florentines alarmed by this circumstance and reduced to despondency by their frequent losses thought themselves unable to sustain the war alone and sent ambassadors to the venetians to beg they would lend their aid to oppose the greatness of one who if allowed to aggrandize himself would soon become as dangerous to them as to the florentines themselves the venetians were advised to adopt the same course by francesco carmignuola one of the most distinguished warriors of those times who had been in the service of the duke and had afterward quitted it but they hesitated not knowing how far to trust him for they thought his enmity with the duke was only feigned while in this suspense it was found that the duke by means of a servant of carmignuola had caused poison to be given him in his food which although it was not fatal reduced him to extremity the truth being discovered the venetians laid aside their suspicion and as the florentines still solicited their assistance a treaty was formed between the two powers by which they agreed to carry on the war at the common expense of both the conquest in lombardy to be assigned to the venetians those in romagna and tuscany to the florentines and carmignuola was appointed captain-general of the league by this treaty the war was commenced in lombardy where it was admirably conducted for in a few months many places were taken from the duke together with the city of brescia the capture of which was in those days considered a most brilliant exploit the war had continued from fourteen twenty two to fourteen twenty seven and the citizens of florence were so wearied of the taxes that had been imposed during that time that it was resolved to revise them preparatory to their amelioration that they might be equalized according to the means of each citizen it was proposed that whoever possessed property of the value of one hundred florins should pay half a florin of taxes individual contribution would thus be determined by an invariable rule and not left to the discretion of parties and as it was found that the new method would press heavily upon the powerful classes they used their utmost endeavors to prevent it from becoming law giovanni de medici alone declared himself in favor of it and by his means it was passed in order to determine the amount each had to pay it was necessary to consider his property in the aggregate which the florentines call a catastare in which in this application of it would signify to rate or value and hence this tax received the name of catasto the new method of rating performed a powerful check to the tyranny of the great who could no longer oppress the lower classes or silence them with threats in the council as they had formerly done and it therefore gave general satisfaction though to the wealthy classes it was in the highest degree offensive but as it is found men are never satisfied but that the possession of one advantage only makes them desire more the people not content with the equality of taxation which the new law produced demanded that the same rule should be applied to past years that an investigation should be made to determine how much according to the catasto the rich had paid less than their share and that they should now pay up to an equality with those who in order to meet the demand unjustly made had been compelled to sell their possessions this proposal alarmed the great more than the catasto had done and in self-defense they unceasingly decried it declaring it in the highest degree unjust and being laid not only on immovable 
but movable property which people possess today and lose tomorrow, that many persons have hidden wealth which the catasto cannot reach, that those who leave their own affairs to manage those of the Republic should be less burdened by her, it being enough for them to give their labor, and that it was unjust of the city to take both their property and their time, while of others she only took money. The advocates of the catasto replied that if movable property varies, the taxes would also vary, and frequently rating it would remedy the evil to which it was subject, that it was unnecessary to mention those who possessed hidden property, for it would be unreasonable to take taxes for that which produced no interest and that if it paid nothing it could not fail to be discovered, that those who did not like to labor for the Republic might cease to do so, for no doubt she would find plenty of loving citizens who would take pleasure in assisting her with both money and counsel, that the advantages and honors of a participation in the government are so great that of themselves they are a sufficient remuneration to those who thus employ themselves without wishing to be excused from paying their share of taxes, but, they added, the real grievance had not been mentioned, for those who were offended with the catastro regretted they could no longer involve the city in all the difficulties of war without injury to themselves, now that they had to contribute like the rest, and that if this law had then been enforced they would not have gone to war with King Ladislaus or the Duke Filippo, both which enterprises had been not through necessity, but to impoverish the citizens. The excitement was appeased by Giovanni de' Medici, who said, it is not well to go into things so long past unless to learn something for our present guidance, and if in former times the taxation has been unjust, we ought to be thankful that we have now discovered a method of making it equitable, and hope that this will be the means of uniting the citizens, not of dividing them, which would certainly be the case were they to attempt the recovery of taxes for the past and make them equal to the present, and that he who is content with a moderate victory is always most successful for those who would more than conquer commonly lose. With such words as these he calmed the disturbance, and this retrospective equalization was no longer contemplated. The war with the Duke still continued, but peace was at length restored by means of a legate of the Pope. The Duke, however, from the first disregarded the conditions, so that the League again took arms, and meeting the enemy's forces at Maclovio, routed them. After this defeat, the Duke again made proposals for peace, to which the Florentines and Venetians both agreed, the former from jealousy of the Venetians, thinking they had spent quite enough money in the aggrandizement of others, the latter because they found Carminuola, after the defeat of the Duke, proceed but coldly in their cause, so that they thought it no longer safe to trust him. A treaty was therefore concluded in 1428, by which the Florentines recovered the places they had lost in Romagna, and the Venetians kept Brescia, to which the Duke added Bergamo and the country around it. In this war the Florentines expended three millions and a half of ducats, extended the territory and power of the Venetians, and brought poverty and disunion upon themselves. Being at peace with their neighbors, domestic troubles recommenced. The great citizens could not endure the catastal, and not knowing how to set it aside, they endeavored to raise up more numerous enemies to the measure, and thus provide themselves with allies to assist them in annulling it. They therefore instructed the officers appointed to levy the tax, that the law required them to extend the catasto over the property of their nearest neighbors, to see if Florentine wealth was concealed among it. The dependent states were therefore ordered to present a schedule of their property against a certain time. This was extremely offensive to the people of Volterra, who sent to the signory to complain of it. But the officers, in great wrath, committed eighteen of the complainants to prison. The Volterrani, however, out of regard for their fellow countrymen who were arrested, did not proceed to any violence. End of Book 4, Chapter 3 Recording by Without a Map travelingwithoutamap.blogspot.com Book 4, Chapter 4 of The History of Florence This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy Volume 1 by Niccolò Machiavelli Translator Unknown Book 4, Chapter 4 
Death of Giovanni de' Medici. His character. Insurrection of Volterra. Volterra returns to her allegiance. Niccolò Fortebraccio attacks the Lucchese. Diversity of opinion about the Lucchese War. War with Lucca. Astore Gianni and Rinaldo degli Albizzi appointed commissaries. Violence of Astore Gianni. About this time Giovanni de' Medici was taken ill, and finding his end approach, called his sons Cosmo and Lorenzo to him, to give them his last advice, and said, I find I have nearly reached the term which God and nature appointed at my birth, and I die content, knowing that I leave you rich, healthy, and of such standing in society, that if you pursue the same course that I have, you will live respected in Florence, and in favour with every one. Nothing cheers me so much at this moment as the recollection that I have never willfully offended any one, but have always used my utmost endeavours to confer benefits upon all. I would have you do so too. With regard to state affairs, if you would live in security, take just such a share as the laws and your countrymen think proper to bestow. Thus you will escape both danger and envy. For it is not what is given to any individual, but what he has determined to possess, that occasions odium. You will thus have a larger share than those who endeavour to engross more than belongs to them, for they thus usually lose their own, and before they lose it, live in constant disquiet. By adopting this method, although among so many enemies, and surrounded by so many conflicting interests, I have not only maintained my reputation, but increased my influence. If you pursue the same course, you will be attended by the same good fortune. If otherwise, you may be assured your end will resemble that of those who in our times have brought ruin both upon themselves and their families. Soon after this interview with his sons, Giovanni died, regretted by every one, as his many excellencies deserved. He was compassionate, not only bestowing alms on those who asked them, but very frequently relieving the necessities of the poor, without having been solicited so to do. He loved all, praised the good, and pitied the infirmities of the wicked. He never sought the honours of government, yet enjoyed them all, and never went to the palace unless by request. He loved peace and shunned war, relieved mankind in adversity, and assisted them in prosperity. Never applied the public money to his own uses, but contributed to the public wealth. He was courteous in office, not a man of great eloquence, but possessed of extraordinary prudence. His demeanour expressed melancholy, but after a short time his conversation became pleasant and facetious. He died exceedingly rich in money, but still more in good fame and the best wishes of mankind and the wealth and respect he left behind him were not only preserved, but increased by his son Cosmo. The Volteran ambassadors grew weary of lying in prison, and to obtain their liberty promised to comply with the commands of the Florentines. Being set free and returned to their city, the time arrived for the new priors to enter upon office, and among those who were drawn was one named Giusto, a plebeian, but possessing great influence with his class, and one of those who had been imprisoned at Florence. He, being inflamed with hatred against the Florentines, on account of his public as well as personal injuries, was further stimulated by Giovanni di Contugi, a man of noble family, and his colleague in office, to induce the people, by the authority of the priors and his own influence, to withdraw their country from the power of the Florentines, and make himself prince. Prompted by these motives, Giusto took arms, rode through the city, seized the Capitano, who resided in it, on behalf of the Florentines, and with the consent of the people, became lord of Volterra. This circumstance greatly displeased the Florentines, but having just made peace with the duke, and the treaty being yet uninfringed on either side, they bethought themselves in a condition to recover the place. And that the opportunity might not be lost, 
they immediately appointed Rinaldo degli Albizzi and Palastrozzi commissaries, and sent them upon the expedition. In the meantime, Giusto, who expected the Florentines would attack him, requested assistance of Lucca and Siena. The latter refused, alleging her alliance with Florence. And Pagolo Guinigi, to regain the favour of the Florentines, which he imagined he had lost in the war with the Duke, and by his friendship for Filippo, not only refused assistance to Giusto, but sent his messenger prisoner to Florence. The commissaries, to come upon the Volterrani unawares, assembled their cavalry, and having raised a good body of infantry in the Val d'Arno Inferiore, and the country about Pisa, proceeded to Volterra. Although attacked by the Florentines, and abandoned by his neighbours, Giusto did not yield to fear, but trusting to the strength of the city, and the ruggedness of the country around it, prepared for his defence. There lived at Volterra one Arcolano, brother of that Giovanni Contugi, who had persuaded Giusto to assume the command. He possessed influence among the nobility, and having assembled a few of his most confidential friends, he assured them that by this event God had come to the relief of their necessities, for if they would only take arms, deprive Giusto of the seigneury, and give up the city to the Florentines, they might be sure of obtaining the principal offices, and the place would retain all its ancient privileges. Having gained them over, they went to the palace in which Giusto resided, and while part of them remained below, Arcolano, with three others, proceeded to the chamber above, where, finding him with some citizens, they drew him aside, as if desirous to communicate something of importance, and conversing on different subjects, led him to the lower apartment, and fell upon him with their swords. They, however, were not so quick as to prevent Giusto from making use of his own weapon, for with it he seriously wounded two of them, but being unable to resist so many, he was at last slain, and his body thrown into the street. Arcolano and his party gave up the city to the Florentine commissaries, who, being at hand with their forces, immediately took possession. But the condition of Volterra was worse than before, for among other things which operated to her disadvantage, most of the adjoining countryside was separated from her, and she was reduced to the rank of a vicariate. Volterra having been lost, and recovered almost at the same time, present circumstances afforded nothing of sufficient importance to occasion a new war, if ambition had not again provoked one. Niccolò Fortebraccio, the son of a sister of Braccio da Perugia, had been in the service of the Florentines during most of their wars with the Duke. Upon the restoration of peace he was discharged, but when the affair of Volterra took place, being encamped with his people at Fucecchio, the commissaries availed themselves both of himself and his forces. Some thought that while Rinaldo conducted the expedition along with him, he persuaded him, under one pretext or another, to attack the Lucchese, assuring him that if he did so, the Florentines would consent to undertake an expedition against them, and would appoint him to the command. When Volterra was recovered, and Niccolò returned to his quarters at Fucecchio, he, either at the persuasion of Rinaldo, or of his own accord, in November 1429, took possession of Ruotti and Compito, castles belonging to the Lucchese, with three hundred cavalry and as many infantry, and then, descending into the plain, plundered the inhabitants to a vast amount. The news of this incursion having reached Florence, persons of all classes were seen gathered in parties throughout the city discussing the matter, and nearly all were in favour of an expedition against Lucca. Of the grandees thus disposed were the Medici and their party, and with them also Rinaldo, either because he thought the enterprise beneficial to the Republic, or induced by his own ambition, and the expectation of being appointed to the command. Niccolò da Uzzano and his party were opposed to the war. It seems hardly credible that such contrary opinions should prevail, though at different times, in the same men and the same city, upon the subject of war, 
for the same citizens and people that, during the ten years of peace, had incessantly blamed the war undertaken against Duke Filippo in defence of liberty, now, after so much expense and trouble, with their utmost energy, insisted on hostilities against Lucca, which, if successful, would deprive that city of her liberty, while those who had been in favour of a war with the Duke were opposed to the present. So much more ready are the multitude to covet the possessions of others than to preserve their own, and so much more easily are they led by the hope of acquisition than by the fear of loss. The suggestions of the latter appear incredible till they are verified, and the pleasing anticipations of the former are cherished as facts, even while the advantages are very problematical, or at best remote. The people of France were inspired with hope, by the acquisitions which Niccolò Fortebraccio had made, and by letters received from their rectors in the vicinity of Lucca, for their deputies at Vico and Pescia had written that if permission were given to them to receive the castles that offered to surrender, the whole country of Lucca would very soon be obtained. It must, however, be added that an ambassador was sent by the governor of Lucca to Florence, to complain of the attack made by Niccolò, and to entreat that the seigneury would not make war against a neighbour, and a city that had always been friendly to them. The ambassador was Jacopo Viviani, who, a short time previously, had been imprisoned by Pagolo Ginigi, governor of Lucca, for having conspired against him. Although he had been found guilty, his life was spared, and as Pagolo thought the forgiveness mutual, he reposed confidence in him. Jacopo, more mindful of the danger he had incurred than of the lenity exercised towards him, on his arrival in Florence, secretly instigated the citizens to hostilities, and these instigations, added to other hopes, induced the seigneury to call the council together, at which four hundred and ninety-eight citizens assembled, before whom the principal men of the city discussed the question. Among the first who addressed the assembly in favour of the expedition was Rinaldo. He pointed out the advantage that would accrue from the acquisition, and justified the enterprise from its being left open to them by the Venetians and the Duke, and that, as the Pope was engaged in the affairs of Naples, he could not interfere. He then remarked upon the facility of the expedition, showing that Luca, being now in bondage to one of her own citizens, had lost her natural vigour and former anxiety for the preservation of her liberty, and would either be surrendered to them by the people, in order to expel the tyrant, or by the tyrant for fear of the people. He recalled the remembrance of the injuries done to the Republic by the governor of Luca, his malevolent disposition toward them, and their embarrassing situation with regard to him, if the Pope or the Duke were to make war upon them, and concluded that no enterprise was ever undertaken by the people of Florence with such perfect facility, more positive advantage, or greater justice in its favour. In a reply to this, Niccolò da Uzzano stated that the city of Florence never entered on a more unjust or more dangerous project, or one more pregnant with evil than this. In the first place, they were going to attack a Guelphic city that had always been friendly to the Florentine people, and had frequently, at great hazard, received the Guelphs into her bosom, when they were expelled from their own country that in the history of the past there was not an instance, while Lucca was free, of her having done an injury to the Florentines, and that, if they had been injured by her enslavers, as formerly by Castruccio, and now by the present governor, the fault was not in the city, but in her tyrant. That if they could assail the latter without detriment to the people, he should have less scruple, but as this was impossible, he could not consent that a city which had been friendly to Florence should be plundered of her wealth. However, as it was usual at present to pay little or no regard, either to equity or injustice, he would consider the matter solely with reference to the advantage of Florence. He thought that what could not easily be attended by pernicious consequences might be esteemed useful, but he could not imagine how an enterprise should be called advantageous, 
in which the evils were certain, and the utility doubtful. The certain evils were the expenses with which it would be attended, and these, he foresaw, would be sufficiently great to alarm even a people that had long been in repose, much more one wearied, as they were, by a tedious and expensive war. The advantage that might be gained was the acquisition of Lucca, which he acknowledged to be great. But the hazards were so enormous and immeasurable, as in his opinion to render the conquest quite impossible. He could not induce himself to believe that the Venetians, or Filippo, would willingly allow them to make the acquisition, for the former only consented in appearance, in order to avoid the semblance of ingratitude, having so lately, with Florentine money, acquired such an extent of dominion, that, as regarded the Duke, it would greatly gratify him to see them involved in new wars and expenses for being exhausted and defeated on all sides, he might again assail them, and that, if, after having undertaken it, their enterprise against Lucca were to prove successful, and offer them the fullest hope of victory, the Duke would not want an opportunity of frustrating their labours, either by assisting the Lucchese secretly with money, or by apparently disbanding his own troops, and then sending them, as if they were soldiers of fortune, to their relief. He therefore advised that they should give up the idea, and behave towards the tyrant, in such a way as to create him as many enemies as possible, for there was no better method of reducing Lucca than to let them live under the tyrant, oppressed and exhausted by him, for, if prudently managed, that city would soon get into such a condition that he could not retain it, and being ignorant or unable to govern itself, it must of necessity fall into their power. But he saw that his discourse did not please them, and that his words were unheeded. He would, however, predict this to them, that they were about to commence a war in which they would expend vast sums, incur great domestic dangers, and instead of becoming masters of Lucca, they would deliver her from her tyrant, and of a friendly city, feeble and oppressed, they would make one free and hostile, and that in time she would become an obstacle to the greatness of their own republic. The question having been debated on both sides, they proceeded to vote as usual, and of the citizens present only ninety-eight were against the enterprise. Thus determined in favour of war, they appointed a council of ten for its management, and hired forces, both horse and foot. Astorre Gianni and Rinaldo degli Albizzi were appointed commissaries, and Niccolò Fortebraccio, on agreeing to give up to the Florentines the places he had taken, was engaged to conduct the enterprise as their captain. The commissaries, having arrived with the army in the country of the Lucchese, divided their forces, one part of which, under Astorre, extended itself along the plain towards Camaiore and Pietra Santa, while Rinaldo, with the other division, took the direction of the hills, presuming that when the citizens found themselves deprived of the surrounding country, they would easily submit. The proceedings of the commissaries were unfortunate, not that they failed to occupy many places, but from the complaints made against them of mismanaging the operations of the war and Astore Gianni had certainly given very sufficient cause for the charges against him. There is a fertile and populous valley near Pietra Santa called Seravezza, whose inhabitants, on learning the arrival of the commissary, presented themselves before him, and begged he would receive them as faithful subjects of the Florentine Republic. Astore pretended to accept their proposal, but immediately ordered his forces to take possession of all the passes and strong positions of the valley, assembled the men in the principal church, took them all prisoners, and then caused his people to plunder and destroy the whole country with the greatest avarice and cruelty, making no distinction in favour of consecrated places, and violating the women, both married and single. These things being known in Florence, displeased not only the magistracy, but the whole city. End of chapter 4
Book four, chapter five of the History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume One, by Niccolò Machiavelli. Translator Unknown. Book four, chapter five. The inhabitants of Serravezza appealed to the Signory, complaints against Rinaldo degli Albizzi, the commissaries changed, Filippo Brunelleschi proposes to submerge the country about Lucca, Pagolo Guinigi asks assistance of the Duke of Milan, the Duke sends Francesco Sforza, Pagolo Guinigi expelled. The Florentines routed by the forces of the Duke. The acquisitions of the Lucchese after the victory. Conclusion of the war. A few of the inhabitants of the valley of Serravezza, having escaped the hands of the commissary, came to Florence and acquainted every one in the streets with their miserable situation, and by the advice of those who, either through indignation at his wickedness or from being of the opposite party, wished to punish the commissary, they went to the Council of Ten, and requested an audience. This being granted, one of them spoke to the following effect. We feel assured, magnificent lords, that we shall find credit and compassion from the Signory, when you learn how your commissary has taken possession of our country, and in what manner he has treated us. Our valley, as the memorials of your ancient houses abundantly testify, was always Guelphic, and has often proved a secure retreat to your citizens when persecuted by the Ghibellines. Our forefathers, and ourselves too, have always revered the name of this noble republic as the leader and head of their party. While the Lucchese were Guelphs, we willingly submitted to their government, but when enslaved by the tyrant who forsook his old friends to join the Ghibelline faction, we have obeyed him more through force than good will, and God knows how often we have prayed that we might have an opportunity of showing our attachment to our ancient party, but how blind are mankind in their wishes. That which we desired for our safety has proved our destruction. As soon as we learnt that your ensigns were approaching, we hastened to meet your commissary, not as an enemy, but as the representative of our ancient laws, placed our valley, our persons, and our fortunes in his hands, and commended them to his good faith, believing him to possess the soul, if not of a Florentine, at least of a man. Your lordships will forgive us, for, unable to support his cruelties, we are compelled to speak. Your commissary has nothing of the man but the shape, nor of a Florentine but the name. A more deadly pest, a more savage beast, a more horrid monster, never was imagined in the human mind. For, having assembled us in our church, under pretense of wishing to speak with us, he made us prisoners. He then burnt and destroyed the whole valley, carried off our property, ravaged every place, destroyed everything, violated the women, dishonoured the virgins, and dragging them from the arms of their mothers, gave them up to the brutality of his soldiery. If by any injury to the Florentine people we merited such treatment, or if he had vanquished us armed in our defence, we should have less reason for complaint. We should have accused ourselves, and thought that either our mismanagement or our arrogance had deservedly brought the calamity upon us. But after having freely presented ourselves to him unarmed, to be robbed and plundered with such unfeeling barbarity, is more than we can bear. And though we might have filled Lombardy with complaints and charges against this city, and spread the story of our misfortunes over the whole of Italy, we did not wish to slander so just and pious a republic, with the baseness and perfidy of one wicked citizen, whose cruelty and avarice, had we known them before our ruin was complete, we should have endeavoured to satiate, though indeed they are insatiable, and with one half of our property have saved the rest. But the opportunity is past, we are compelled to have recourse to you, and beg that you will succour the distresses of your subjects, 
that others may not be deterred by our example from submitting themselves to your authority. And if our extreme distress cannot prevail with you to assist us, be induced, by your fear of the wrath of God, who has seen his temple plundered and burnt, and his people betrayed in his bosom. Having said this, they threw themselves on the ground, crying aloud, and praying that their property and their country might be restored to them, and that if the seigneury could not give them back their honour, they would at least restore husbands to their wives, and children to their fathers. The atrocity of the affair having already been made known, and now by the living words of the sufferers presented before them, excited the compassion of the magistracy. They ordered the immediate return of Astore, who, being tried, was found guilty and admonished. They sought the goods of the inhabitants of Seravezza. All that could be recovered was restored to them, and as time and circumstance gave opportunity, they were compensated for the rest. Complaints were made against Rinaldo degli Albizzi, that he carried on the war, not for the advantage of the Florentine people, but his own private emolument, that as soon as he was appointed commissary, he lost all desire to take Lucca, for it was sufficient for him to plunder the country, fill his estates with cattle, and his house with booty, and not content with what his own satellites took he purchased that of the soldiery, so that instead of a commissary he became a merchant. These calumnies coming to his ears disturbed the temper of this proud but upright man, more than quite became his dignity. He was so exasperated against the citizens and magistracy, that without waiting for or asking permission, he returned to Florence, and presenting himself before the Council of Ten, he said that he well knew how difficult and dangerous a thing it was to serve an unruly people and a divided city, for the one listens to every report, the other pursues improper measures, they neglect to reward good conduct, and heap censure upon whatever appears doubtful, so that victory wins no applause, error is accused by all, and if vanquished, universal condemnation is incurred, from one's own party, through envy, and from enemies, through hatred, persecution results. He confessed that the baseness of the present calumnies had conquered his patience, and changed the temper of his mind. But he would say he had never, for fear of a false accusation, avoided doing what appeared to him beneficial to the city. However, he trusted the magistrates would in future be more ready to defend their fellow-citizens, so that the latter might continue anxious to effect the prosperity of their country, that, as it was not customary at Florence to award triumphs for success, they ought at least to be protected from calumny, and that being citizens themselves, and at any moment liable to false accusations, they might easily conceive how painful it is to an upright mind to be oppressed with slander. The ten endeavoured, as well as circumstances would admit, to soothe the acerbity of his feelings, and confided the care of the expedition to Neri di Gino and Alemano Salviati, who, instead of overrunning the country, advanced near to Lucca. As the weather had become extremely cold, the forces established themselves at Campanole, which seemed to the commissaries waste of time and wishing to draw nearer the place, the soldiery refused to comply, although the ten had insisted they should pitch their camp before the city, and would not hear of any excuse. At that time there lived at Florence a very distinguished architect, named Filippo di Ser Brunelleschi, of whose works our city is full and whose merit was so extraordinary, that after his death his statue in marble was erected in the principal church, with an inscription underneath, which still bears testimony to those who read it, of his great talents. This man pointed out, that in consequence of the relative positions of the river Sergio and the city of Lucca, the wastes of the river might be made to inundate the surrounding country, and place the city in a kind of lake. His reasoning on this point appeared so clear, and the advantage to the besiegers so obvious and inevitable, that the ten were induced to make the experiment. 
The result, however, was quite contrary to their expectation, and produced the utmost disorder in the Florentine camp, for the Lucchese raised high embankments in the direction of the ditch made by our people to conduct the waters of the Sergio, and one night cut through the embankment of the ditch itself, so that, having first prevented the water from taking the course designed by the architect, they now caused it to overflow the plain, and compelled the Florentines, instead of approaching the city as they wished, to take a more remote position. The design having failed, the Council of Ten, who had been re-elected, sent as commissary Giovanni Gicciardini, who encamped before Lucca with all possible expedition. Pagolo Guinigi, finding himself thus closely pressed by the advice of Antonio del Rosso, then representative of the Sienese at Lucca, sent Salvestro Trento and Leonardo Bonvisi to Milan to request assistance from the Duke. But finding him indisposed to comply, they secretly engaged, on the part of the people, to deliver their governor up to him and give him possession of the place, at the same time intimating that if he did not immediately follow this advice, he would not long have the opportunity, since it was the intention of Pagolo to surrender the city to the Florentines, who were very anxious to obtain it. The Duke was so much alarmed with this idea, that, setting aside all other considerations, he caused Count Francesco Sforza, who was engaged in his service, to make a public request for permission to go to Naples, and, having obtained it, he proceeded with his forces directly to Lucca, though the Florentines, aware of the deception, and apprehensive of the consequences, had sent to the Count Boccaccino Alamani, his friend, to frustrate this arrangement. Upon the arrival of the Count at Lucca, the Florentines removed their camp to Librafatta, and the Count proceeded immediately to Pescia, where Pagolo Diacetto was lieutenant-governor, who, promoted by fear rather than any better motive, fled to Pistoia, and if the place had not been defended by Giovanni Malavolti, to whom the command was entrusted, it would have been lost. The Count, failing in his attempt, went to Borgo Abugiano, which he took, and burnt the castle of Stigliano, in the same neighbourhood. The Florentines, being informed of these disasters, found that they must have recourse to those remedies which upon former occasions had often proved useful. Knowing that with mercenary soldiers, when force is insufficient, corruption commonly prevails, they offered the Count a large sum of money on condition that he should quit the city and give it up to them. The Count, finding that no more money was to be had from Lucca, resolved to take it of those who had it to dispense and agreed with the Florentines, not to give them Lucca, which for decency he could not consent to, but to withdraw his troops, and abandon it, on condition of receiving fifty thousand ducats. And having made this agreement, to induce the Lucchese to excuse him to the Duke, he consented that they should expel their tyrant. Antonio del Rosso, as we remarked above, was Sienese ambassador at Lucca, and with the authority of the Count he contrived the ruin of Pagolo Guinigi. The heads of the conspiracy were Piero Cenami and Giovanni da Chivizzano. The Count resided upon the Serchio, at a short distance from the city, and with him was Lancilaio, the son of Pagolo. The conspirators, about forty in number, went armed at night in search of Pagolo, who, on hearing the noise they made, came towards them quite astonished, and demanded the cause of their visit. To which Piero Cenami replied, that they had long been governed by him, and led about against the enemy, to die either by hunger or the sword, but were resolved to govern themselves for the future, and demanded the keys of the city and the treasure. Pagolo said the treasure was consumed, but the keys and himself were in their power, he only begged that as his command had begun and continued without bloodshed, it might conclude in the same manner. Count Francesco conducted Pagolo and his son to the Duke, and they afterward died in prison. The departure of the Count having delivered Lucca from her tyrant, and the Florentines from their fear of his soldiery, the former prepared for her defence, and the latter resumed the siege. They appointed the Count of Urbino, 
to conduct their forces, and he pressed the Lucchese so closely that they were again compelled to ask the assistance of the duke, who dispatched Niccolò Piccinino, under the same pretense as he previously sent Count Francesco. The Florentine forces met him on his approach to Lucca, and at the passage of the Sergio a battle ensued, in which they were routed, the commissary, with a few of his men, escaping to Pisa. This defeat filled the Florentines with dismay, and as the enterprise had been undertaken with the entire approbation of the great body of the people, they did not know whom to find fault with and therefore railed against those who had been appointed to the management of the war, reviving the charges made against Rinaldo. They were, however, more severe against Giovanni Gicciardini than any other, declaring that if he had wished, he might have put a period to the war at the departure of Count Francesco, but that he had been bribed with money, for he had sent home a large sum, naming the party who had been entrusted to bring it and the persons to whom it had been delivered. These complaints and accusations were carried to so great a length that the captain of the people, induced by the public voice, and pressed by the party opposed to the war, summoned him to trial. Giovanni appeared, though full of indignation. However, his friends, from regard to their own character, adopted such a course with the capitano as induced him to abandon the inquiry. After this victory, the Lucchese not only recovered the places that had belonged to them, but occupied all the country of Pisa, except Baintina, Calcinaja, Livorno, and Librafatta, and, had not a conspiracy been discovered that was formed in Pisa, they would have secured that city also. The Florentines again prepared for battle, and appointed Micheletto, a pupil of Sforza, to be their leader. The duke, on the other hand, followed up this victory, and that he might bring a greater power against the Florentines, induced the Genovese, the Sienese, and the governor of Piombino to enter into a league for the defence of Lucca, and to engage Niccolò Piccinino to conduct their forces. Having by this step declared his design, the Venetians and the Florentines renewed their league, and the war was carried on openly in Tuscany and Lombardy in each of which several battles were fought with variety of fortune. At length, both sides being wearied out, they came to terms for the cessation of hostilities, in May 1433. By this arrangement, the Florentines, Lucchese and Sienese, who had each occupied many fortresses belonging to the others, gave them all up, and each party resumed its original possessions. End of Chapter 5、Book、Four, Chapter 6 of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy. Volume One, by Niccolo Machiavelli, translator unknown, Book Four, Chapter Six. Cosmo de' Medici, his character and mode of proceedings. The greatness of Cosmo excites the jealousy of the citizens. The opinion of Niccolo da Uzzano. Scandalous divisions of the Florentines. Death of Niccolo da Uzzano. Bernardo Quadagni, Gonfalonier. Adopts measures against Cosmo. Cosmo arrested in the palace. He is apprehensive of attempts against his life. During the war, the malignant humors of the city were in constant activity. Cosmo de' Medici, after the death of Giovanni, engaged more earnestly in public affairs, and conducted himself with more zeal and boldness in regard to his friends than his father had done, so that those who rejoiced at Giovanni's death, finding what the son was likely to become, perceived they had no cause for exultation. Cosmo was one of the most prudent of men, of grave and courteous demeanor, extremely liberal and humane. He never attempted anything against parties or against rulers, but was bountiful to all, and by the unwearied generosity of his disposition 
made himself partisans of all ranks of the citizens. This mode of proceeding increased the difficulties of those who were in the government, and Cosmo himself hoped that by its pursuit he might be able to live in Florence, as much respected and as secure as any other citizen, or if the ambition of his adversaries compelled him to adopt a different course, arms and the favor of his friends would enable him to become more so. Averardo de' Medici and Puccio Pucci were greatly instrumental in the establishment of his power, the former by his boldness, the latter by unusual prudence and sagacity, contributed to his aggrandizement. Indeed, the advice of wisdom of Puccio were so highly esteemed, that Cosmo's party was rather distinguished by the name of Puccio than by his own. By this divided city the enterprise against Luca was undertaken, and the bitterness of party spirit, instead of being abated, increased. Although the friends of Cosmo had been in favor of it, many of the adverse faction were sent to assist in the management, as being men of greater influence in the state. Averardo de' Medici, and the rest being unable to prevent this, endeavored with all their might to calumniate them, and when any unfavorable circumstance occurred, and there were many, fortune and the exertions of the enemy were never supposed to be the causes, but solely the want of capacity in the commissary. This disposition aggravated the offenses of Astorre Gianni. This excited the indignation of Rinaldo degli Albizzi, and made him resign his commission without leave. This, too, compelled the captain of the people to require the appearance of Giovanni Guicardini, and from this arose all the other charges which were made against the magistrates and the commissaries. Real evils were magnified, and real ones feigned, and the true and the false were equally believed by the people, who were almost universally their foes. All these events and extraordinary modes of proceeding were perfectly known to Niccolo da Uzzano and the other leaders of the party, and they had often consulted together for the purpose of finding a remedy, but without effect, though they were aware of the danger of allowing them to increase, and the great difficulties that would attend any attempt to remove or abate them. Niccolo da Uzzano was the earliest to take offence, and while the war was proceeding without, and these troubles within, Niccolo Barbadoro, desirous of inducing him to consent to the ruin of Cosmo, waited upon him at his house, and finding him alone in his study, and very pensive, endeavoured, with the best reasons he could advance, to persuade him to agree with Rinaldo on Cosmo's expulsion. Niccolo da Uzzano replied as follows, It would be better for thee and thy house, as well as for our republic, if thou and those who follow thee in this opinion had birds of silver instead of gold, as is said of thee, for advice proceeding from the hoary head of long experience would be wiser and of greater service to all. It appears to me that those who talk of driving Cosmo out of Florence would do well to consider what is their strength and what that of Cosmo. You have named one party, that of the nobility, the other that of the plebeians. If the fact corresponded with the name, the victory would still be most uncertain, and the example of the ancient nobility of this city, who were destroyed by the plebeians, ought rather to impress us with fear than with hope. We have, however, still further cause for apprehension from the division of our party and the union of our adversaries. In the first place, Neri di Gino and Nerone di Nighi, two of our principal citizens, have never so fully declared their sentiments as to enable us to determine whether they are most our friends or those of our opponents. There are many families, even many houses divided. Many are opposed to us through envy of brothers or relatives. I will recall to your recollection two or three of the most important. You may think of the others at your leisure. Of the sons of Maso degli Albizzi, Luca, from envy of Rinaldo, has thrown himself into their hands. In the house of 
Piccardini, of the sons of Luigi, Piero is the enemy of Giovanni, and did favor to our adversaries. Tommaso and Niccolo Soderini openly oppose us on account of their hatred of their uncle Francesco, so that if we consider well what we are and what our enemies, I cannot see why we should be called noble any more than they. If it is because they are followed by the plebeians, we are in a worse condition on that account, and they in a better. For were it to come either to arms or to votes, we should not be able to resist them. True it is, we still preserve our dignity, our precedence, the priority of our position, but this arises from the former reputation of the government, which has now continued fifty years, and whenever we come to the proof, or they discover our weakness, we shall lose it. If you were to say, the justice of our cause ought to augment our influence, and diminish theirs, I answer, that this justice requires to be perceived and believed by others, as well as by ourselves. But this is not the case, for the justice of our cause is wholly founded upon our suspicion, that Cosmo designs to make himself prince of the city. And although we entertain this suspicion and suppose it to be correct, others have it not. But what is worse, they charge us with the very design of which we accuse him. Those actions of Cosmo, which lead us to suspect him, are that he lends money indiscriminately, and not to private persons only, but to the public, and not to Florentines only, but to the condottieri, the soldiers of fortune. Besides, he assists any citizen who requires magistral aid, and by the universal interest he possesses in the city, raises first one friend and then another to higher grades of honor. Therefore, to adduce our reasons for expelling him would be to say that he is kind, generous, liberal, and beloved by all. Now tell me, what law is there which forbids, disapproves, or condemns men for being pious, liberal, or benevolent? And though they are all modes adopted by those who aim at sovereignty, they are not believed to be such nor have we sufficient power to make them to be so esteemed. For our conduct has robbed us of confidence, and the city, naturally partial, and having always lived in faction, corrupt, cannot lend its attention to such charges. But even if we were successful in an attempt to expel him, which might easily happen under a favorable seigneury, how could we, being surrounded by his innumerable friends, who would constantly reproach us, and ardently desire to see him again in the city, prevent his return? It would be impossible, for they being so numerous, and having the good will of all upon their side, we should never be secure from them. And as many of his first discovered friends as you might expel, so many enemies would you make, so that in a short time he would return, and the result would be simply this, that we had driven him out a good man, and he had returned to us a bad one. For his nature would be corrupted by those who recalled him, and he, being under obligation, could not oppose them. Or should you design to put him to death, you could not attain your purpose with the magistrates, for his wealth and the corruption of your minds will always save him. But let us suppose him put to death, or that being banished, he did not return. I cannot see how the condition of our republic would be ameliorated. For if we relieve her from Cosmo, we at once make her subject to Rinaldo, and it is my most earnest desire that no citizen may ever, in power and authority, surpass the rest. But if one of these must prevail, I know of no reason that should make me prefer Rinaldo to Cosmo. I shall only say, may God preserve the city from any of her citizens usurping the sovereignty. But if our sins have deserved this, in mercy save us from Rinaldo. I pray thee, therefore, do not advise the adoption of a course, on every account pernicious, nor imagine that, in union with a few, you would be able to oppose the will of the many. For the citizens, some from ignorance and others from malice, are ready to sell the republic at any time, 
and fortune has so much favoured them that they have found a purchaser. Take my advice, then. Endeavour to live moderately, and with regard to liberty. You will find as much cause for suspicion in our party as in that of our adversaries. And when troubles arise, being of neither side, you will be agreeable to both, and you will thus provide for your own comfort, and do no injury to any. These words somewhat abated the eagerness of Barbadoro, so that tranquillity prevailed during the war with Loca. But this being ended, and Niccolo da Uzzano dead, the city being at peace and under no restraint, unhealthy humors increased with fearful rapidity. Rinaldo, considering himself now the leader of the party, constantly entreated and urged every citizen, whom he thought likely to be gonfalonier, to take up arms and deliver the country from him, who, from the malevolence of a few and the ignorance of the multitude, was inevitably reducing it to slavery. These practices of Rinaldo, and those of the contrary side, kept the city full of apprehension, so that whenever a magistracy was created, the numbers of each party composing it were made publicly known, and upon drawing for the seigniory the whole city was aroused. Every case brought before the magistrates, however trivial, was made a subject of contention among them. Secrets were divulged, good and evil alike became objects of favor and opposition, the benevolent and the wicked were alike assailed, and no magistrate fulfilled the duties of his office with integrity. In this state of confusion, Rinaldo, anxious to abate the power of Cosmo, and knowing that Bernardo Guadagni was likely to become gonfalonier, paid his arrears of taxes, that he might not, by being indebted to the public, be incapacitated for holding the office. The drawing soon after took place, and fortune, opposed to our welfare, caused Bernardo to be appointed for the months of September and October. Rinaldo immediately waited upon him, and intimated how much the party of the nobility, and all who wished for repose, rejoiced to find he had attained that dignity, that it now rested with him to act in such a manner as to realize their pleasing expectations. He then enlarged upon the danger of disunion, and endeavored to show that there was no means of attaining the blessing of unity but by the destruction of Cosmo, for he alone, by the popularity acquired, with his enormous wealth, kept them depressed, that he was already so powerful, that if not hindered, he would soon become prince, and that it was the part of a good citizen, in order to prevent such a calamity, to assemble the people in the piazza, and restore liberty to his country. Rinaldo then reminded the new gonfalonier how Salvestro de' Medici was able, though unjustly, to restrain the power of the Guelphs, to whom, by the blood of their ancestors, shed in its cause, the government rightly belonged, and argued that what he was able unjustly to accomplish against so many might surely be easily performed with justice in its favor against one. He encouraged him with the assurance that their friends would be ready in arms to support him, that he need not regard the plebeians who adored Cosmo, since their assistance would be of no greater avail than Giorgio Scali had found it on a similar occasion, and that with regard to his wealth no apprehension was necessary, for when he was under the power of the seigniory his riches would be so too. In conclusion, he averred that this course would unite and secure the Republic, and crown the gonfalonier with glory. Bernardo briefly replied that he thought it necessary to act, exactly as Rinaldo had advised, and that as the time was suitable for action, he should provide himself with forces, being assured, from what Rinaldo had said, he would be supported by his colleagues. Bernardo entered upon the duties of his office, prepared his followers, and having consorted with Rinaldo, summoned Cosmo, who, though many friends dissuaded him from it, obeyed the call, trusting more to his own innocence than to the mercy of the seigniory. 
as soon as he had entered the palace, he was arrested. Rinaldo, with a great number of armed men, and accompanied by nearly the whole of his party, proceeded to the piazza, when the signory assembled the people, and created a balia of two hundred persons, for the reformation of the city. With the least possible delay, they entered upon the consideration of reform, and of the life or death of Cosmo. Many wished him to be banished, others to be put to death, and several were silent, either from compassion toward him, or for fear of the rest, so that these differences prevented them from coming to any conclusion. There is an apartment in the tower of the palace, which occupies the whole of one floor, and is called the Alberghettino, in which Cosmo was confined, under the charge of Federico Malavolti. In this place, hearing the assembly of the consuls, the noise of arms which proceeded from the piazza, and the frequent ringing of the bell to assemble the balia, he was greatly apprehensive for his safety, but still more or less his private enemies should cause him to be put to death in some unusual manner. He scarcely took any food, so that in four days he ate only a small quantity of bread. Federigo, observing his anxiety, said to him, Cosmo, you are afraid of being poisoned, and are evidently hastening your end with hunger. You wrong me if you think I would be a party to such an atrocious act. I do not imagine your life to be in much danger, since you have so many friends, both within the palace and without. But if you should eventually lose it, be assured they will use some other medium than myself for that purpose. For I will never imbue my hands in the blood of any, still less in yours, who never injured me. Therefore cheer up, take some food, and preserve your life for your friends and your country. And that you may do so with greater assurance, I will partake of your meals with you. These words were of great relief to Cosmo, who, with tears in his eyes, embraced and kissed Federigo, earnestly thanking him for so kind and affectionate conduct, and promising, if ever the opportunity were given him, he would not be ungrateful. End of Book 4, Chapter 6「Book Four, Chapter Six of History of Florence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Florence and of the Affairs of Italy, Volume One by Niccolo Machiavelli, Translator Unknown. Book Four, Chapter Six. Cosmo is banished to Padua. Rinaldo degli Albizzi attempts to restore the nobility. New disturbances occasioned by Rinaldo degli Albizzi. Rinaldo takes arms against the signory. His designs are disconcerted. Pope Eugenius in Florence. He endeavors to reconcile the parties. Cosmo is recalled. Rinaldo and his party banished. Glorious return of Cosmo. Cosmo in some degree recovered his spirits, and while the citizens were disputing about him, Federigo, by way of recreation, brought an acquaintance of the gonfalonier to take supper with him, an amusing and facetious person, whose name was Il Farnagazio. The repast being nearly over, Cosmo, who thought he might turn this visit to advantage, for he knew the man very intimately, gave a sign to Federigo, to leave the apartment, and he, guessing the cause, under pretense of going for something that was wanted on the table, left them together. Cosmo, after a few friendly expressions addressed to Il Farnagazio, gave him a small slip of paper, and desired him to go to the director of the hospital of Santa Maria Nuova for one thousand one hundred ducats. He was to take the hundred for himself, and carry the thousand to the Canfalonier, and beg that he would take some suitable occasion of coming to see him. Fernagazio undertook the commission, the money was paid, Bernardo became more humane, and Cosmo was banished to Padua, 
contrary to the wish of Rinaldo, who earnestly desired his death. Averardo and many others of the house of Medici were also banished, and with them Puccio and Giovanni Pucci. To silence those who were dissatisfied with the banishment of Cosmo, they endowed with the power of Abalia, the aid of war, and the capitano of the people. After this sentence, Cosmo on the 3rd of October, 1433, came before the seigneury, by whom the boundary to which he was restricted was specified, and they advised him to avoid passing it, unless he wished them to proceed with greater severity, both against himself and his property. Cosmo received his sentence with a cheerful look, assuring the seigneury that wherever they determined to send him, he would willingly remain. He earnestly begged that as they had preserved his life, they would protect it, for he knew there were many in the piazza who were desirous to take it, and assured them that wherever he might be, himself and his means were entirely at the service of the city, the people, and the seigneury. He was respectfully attended by the gonfalonier, who retained him in the palace till night, then conducted him to his own house to supper, and caused him to be escorted by a strong armed force to his place of banishment. Wherever the cavalcade passed, Cosmo was honorably received, and was publicly visited by the Venetians, not as an exile, but with all the respect due to one in the highest station. Florence, widowed of so great a citizen, one so generally beloved, seemed to be universally sunk in despondency. Victors and the vanquished were alike in fear. Rinaldo, as if inspired with the presage of his future calamities, in order not to appear deficient to himself or his party, assembled many citizens his friends, and informed them that he foresaw their approaching ruin for having allowed themselves to be overcome by the prayers, the tears, and the money of their enemies, and that they did not seem aware they would soon themselves have to entreat and weep, when their prayers would not be listened to, or their tears excite compassion, and that of the money received, they would have to restore the principal, and pay the interest in tortures, exile, and death, that it would have been much better for them to have done nothing than to have left Cosmo alive and his friends in Florence. For great offenders ought either to remain untouched or be destroyed, that there was no, no remedy but to strengthen themselves in the city, so that upon the renewed attempts of their enemies, which would soon take place, they might drive them out with arms, since they had not sufficient civil authority to expel them. The remedy to be adopted, he said, was one that he had long before advocated, which was to regain the friendship of the grandees, restoring and conceding to them all the honors of the city, and thus make themselves strong with that party, since the adversaries had joined the plebeians that by this means they would become the more powerful side, for they would possess greater energy, more comprehensive talent, and an augmented share of influence, and that if this last and only remedy were not adopted, he knew not what other means could he be made use of to preserve the government among so many enemies, or prevent their own ruin and that of the city. Mariotto Baldovinetti, one of the assembly was opposed to this plan, on account of the pride and insupportable nature of the nobility, and said that it would be folly to place themselves again under such inevitable tyranny for the sake of avoiding imaginary dangers from the plebeians. Rinaldo, finding his advice unfavorably received, vexed at his own misfortune and that of his party, imputed the whole to heaven itself, which had resolved upon it rather than to human ignorance and blunders. In this juncture of affairs, no remedial measure being attempted, a letter was found written by Agnolo Azziagioli to Cosmo, acquainting him with the disposition of the city in his favor, and advising him, if possible, to excite a war, and gain a friendship of Neri di Gino. For he imagined the city to be in want of money, and as she would not find any one to serve her, the remembrance of him would be revived in the minds of the citizens, and they would desire his return, and that, 
if Neri were detached from Rinaldo, the party of the latter would be so weakened as to be unable to defend themselves. This letter coming to the hands of the magistrates, Agnolo was taken, put to the torture, and sent into exile. This example, however, did not at all deter Cosmo's party. It was now almost a year since Cosmo had been banished, and the end of August, 1434, being come, Niccolo de Goccio was drowned gonfalonier for the two succeeding months, and with him eight signors, all partisans of Cosmo. This struck terror into Rinaldo and his party, and as it is usual for three days to elapse before the new signory assume the magistracy, and the old resigned their authority, Rinaldo again called together the heads of his party. He endeavored to show them their certain and immediate danger, and that their only remedy was to take arms, and cause Donato Velluti, who was yet gonfalonier, to assemble the people in the piazza and create a balia. He would then deprive the new signory of the magistracy, appoint another, burn the present balloting purses, and by means of a new squittini provide themselves with friends. Many thought this course safe and requisite, others that it was too violent and likely to be attended with great evil. Among those who disliked it was Paul Strozzi, a peaceable, gentle, and humane person, better adapted for literary pursuits than for restraining a party or opposing civil strife. He said that bold and crafty resolutions seem promising at their commencement, but are afterward found difficult to execute, and generally pernicious at their conclusion. That he sought the fear of external wars, the duke's forces being upon the confines of Romagna, would occupy the minds of the signory more than internal dissensions. But still, if any attempt should be made, and it could not take place unnoticed, they would have sufficient time to take arms, and adopt whatever measures might be found necessary for the common good, which being done upon necessity would occasion less excitement among the people, and less danger to themselves. It was therefore concluded that the new signory should come in, that their proceedings should be watched, and if they were found attempting anything against the party, each should take arms, and meet in the piazza of San Polinari, situated near the palace, and whence they might proceed wherever it was found necessary. Having come to this conclusion, Rinaldo's friends separated. The new signory entered upon their office, and the gonfalonier, in order to acquire reputation, and deter those who might intend to oppose him, sent Donato Velluti, his predecessor, to prison, upon the charge of having applied the public money to his own use. He then endeavored to sound his colleagues with respect to Cosmo. Seeing them desirous of his return, he communicated with the leaders of the Medici party, and, by their advice, summoned the hostile chiefs, Rinaldo degli Albizzi, Ridolfo Peruzzi and Niccolo Barbadoro. After this citation, Rinaldo thought further delay would be dangerous. He therefore left his house with a great number of armed men, and was soon joined by Ridolfo Peruzzi and Niccolo Barbadoro. The force accompanying them was composed of several citizens and a great number of disbanded soldiers then in Florence and all assembled according to appointment in the piazza of San Polinari. Paolo Strozzi and Giovanni Gicerdani, though each had assembled a large number of men, kept in their houses, and therefore Rinaldo sent a messenger to request their attendance, and to reprove their delay. Giovanni replied that he should lend sufficient aid against their enemies, if by remaining at home he could prevent his brother Piero from going to the defense of the palace. After many messages, Paola came to San Polinari on horseback, accompanied by two of his people on foot, and unarmed. Rinaldo, on meeting him, sharply reproved him for his negligence, declaring that his refusal to come with the others arose either from defect of principle or want of courage, both of which charges should be avoided by all who wished to preserve such a character 
as he had hitherto possessed, and that if he thought this abominable conduct to his party would induce their enemies, when victorious, to spare him from death or exile, he deceived himself. But for himself, Rinaldo, whatever might happen, he had the consolation of knowing that previously to the crisis he had never neglected his duty in council, and that when it occurred, he had used every possible exertion to repel it with arms. But that Paula and the others would experience aggravated remorse when they considered they had upon three occasions betrayed their country. First, when they saved Cosmo. Next, when they disregarded his advice. And now, the third time, by not coming armed in her defense according to their engagement. To these reproaches Paula made no reply, audible to those around, but, muttering something as he left them, returned to his house. The signory, knowing Rinaldo and his party had taken arms, finding themselves abandoned, caused the palace to be shut up, and having no one to consult they, knew not what curse to adopt. However, Rinaldo, by delaying his coming to the piazza, having waited in expectation of forces which did not join him, lost the opportunity of victory, gave them courage to provide for their defense, and allowed many others to join them, who advised that means should be used to induce their adversaries to lay down their arms. Thereupon, some of the least suspected went on the part of the signory to Rinaldo, and said they did not know what occasion they had given his friends, for thus assembling in arms, that they never had any intention of offending him, and if they had spoken of Cosmo, they had no design of recalling him. So if their fears were thus occasioned, they might at once be dispelled, for that if they came to the palace they would be graciously received, and all their complaints attended to. These words produced no change in Rinaldo's purpose. He bade them provide for their safety, by resigning their offices, and said that then the government of the city would be reorganized for the mutual benefit of all. It rarely happens, where authorities are equal and opinions contrary, that any good resolution is adopted. Rodolfo Peruzzi, moved by this discourse of the citizens, said that all he desired was to prevent the return of Cosmo, and this being granted to them, seemed a sufficient victory. Nor would he, to obtain a greater, fill the city with blood. He would therefore obey the signory, and accordingly went with his people to the palace, where he was received with a hearty welcome. Thus Rinaldo's delay at San Polinari, Pallas' want of courage, and Ridolfo's desertion, deprived their party of all chance of success, while the ardor of the citizens abated, and the Pope's authority did not contribute to its revival. Pope Eugenius was at this time at Florence, having been driven from Rome by the people. These disturbances coming to his knowledge, he thought it a duty suitable to his pastoral office to appease them, and sent the patriarch Giovanni Vitelleschi, Rinaldo's most intimate friend, to entreat the latter to come to an interview with him, as he trusted he had sufficient influence with the signory, to ensure his safety and satisfaction, without injury or bloodshed to the citizens. By his friend's persuasion, Rinaldo proceeded with all his followers to Santa Maria Nuova, where the Pope resided. Eugenius gave him to understand that the signory had empowered him to settle the differences between them, and that all would be arranged to his satisfaction if he laid down his arms. Rinaldo, having witnessed Paula's want of zeal, and the fickleness of Ridolfo Peruzzi, and no better course being open to him, placed himself in the Pope's hands, thinking that at all events the authority of the, His Holiness would ensure his safety. Eugenius then sent word to Niccolo Barbadoro and the rest who remained without, that they were to lay down their arms, for Rinaldo was remaining with the pontiff, to arrange terms of agreement, with the signors, upon which they immediately dispersed and laid aside their weapons. The signory, 
seeing their adversaries disarmed, continued to negotiate an arrangement by means of the Pope, but at the same time sent secretly to the mountains of Pistoia for infantry, which, with what other forces they could collect, were brought into Florence by night. Having taken possession of all the strong positions in the city, they assembled the people in the piazza, and created a new balia, which, without delay, restored Cosmo and those who had been exiled with him to their country, and banished, of the opposite party, Rinaldo degli Albizzi, Ridolfo Perucci, Niccolo Barbadoro, and Paolo Strozzi, with so many other citizens, that there were few places in Italy which did not contain some, and many others beyond her limits were full of them. By this and similar occurrences, Florence was deprived of men of force, and of much wealth and industry. The Pope, seeing such misfortunes befall those who by his entreaties were induced to lay down their arms, was greatly dissatisfied, and condoled with Rinaldo on the injuries he had received through his confidence in him, but advised him to be patient, and hope for some favorable turn of fortune. Rinaldo replied, the want of confidence in those who ought to have trusted me, and the great trust I have reposed in you, have ruined both me and my party. But I blame myself principally for having thought that you, who were expelled from your own country, could preserve me in mine. I have had sufficient experience of the freaks of fortune, and as I have never trusted greatly to prosperity, I shall suffer less inconvenience from adversity, and I know that when she pleases she can become more favorable. But if she should never change, I shall not be very desirous of living in a city in which individuals are more powerful than the laws. For that country alone is desirable, in which property and friends may be safely enjoyed, not one where they may easily be taken from us, and where friends, from fear of losing their property, are compelled to abandon each other in their greatest need. Besides, it has always been less painful to good men to hear of the misfortunes of their country than to witness them, and an honorable exile is always held in greater esteem than slavery at home. He then left the Pope, and full of indignation, blaming himself, his own measures, and the coldness of his friends, went into exile. Cosmo, on the other hand, being informed of his recall, returned to Florence, and it has seldom occurred that any citizen, coming home triumphant from victory, was received by so vast a concourse of people, or such unqualified demonstrations of regard, as he was upon his return from banishment, for by universal consent he was hailed as the benefactor of the people, and the father of his country. End of Book 4, Chapter 6 and end of history of florence